The 101 Dalmatians by Dodie Smith Not long ago, there lived in London a young married couple of Dalmatian dogs named Pongo and Mrs Pongo. They were lucky enough to own a young married couple of humans named Mr and Mrs Dearly, who were gentle, obedient and unusually intelligent, almost canine at times. They understood quite a number of barks, the barks for out please, in please, hurry up with my dinner, and what about a walk? And even when they could not understand, they could often guess, if looked at soulfully or scratched by an eager paw. Mr. Dearly, who had an office in the city, was particularly good at arithmetic. Many people called him a wizard of finance, which is not the same thing as a wizard of magic, though sometimes fairly similar. At the time when this story starts, he was rather unusually rich for a rather unusual reason. He had done the government a great service, something to do with getting rid of the national debt, and, as a reward, had been let off his income tax for life. Also, the government had lent him a small house on the outer circle of Regent's Park, just the right house for a man with a wife and dogs. Before their marriages, Mr Dearly and Pongo had lived in a bachelor flat, where they were looked after by Mr. Dearly's old nurse, Nanny Butler. Mrs. Dearly and Mrs. had also lived in a bachelor flat, there are no such things as spinster flats, where they were looked after by Mrs. Dearly's old nurse, Nanny Cook. The dogs and their pets met at the same time and shared a wonderfully happy double engagement, but they were all a little worried about what was to happen to Nanny Cook and Nanny Butler. And then something happened. Nanny Cook and Nanny Butler met and after a few minutes of deep suspicion took a great liking to each other and they had a good laugh about their names. What a pity we're not a real cook and butler, said Nanny Cook. Yes, that's what's needed now, said Nanny Butler. And then they both together had the great idea. Nanny Cook would train to be a real cook and Nanny Butler would train to be a real butler. They would start the very next day and be fully trained by the wedding. And so when the Dearlies and the Pongos got back from their joint honeymoon, there were Nanny Cook and Nanny Butler, fully trained, ready to welcome them into the little house facing Regent's Park. The Nannies said they no longer expected to be called Nanny and were now prepared to be called by their surnames in the correct way. But though you can call a cook, Cook, the one thing you cannot call a butler is butler. So in the end, both nannies were just called Nanny Darling, as they had always been. After the dogs and the dearlies had been back from their honeymoons for several happy weeks, something even happier happened. Mrs. Dearly took Mrs. across the park to St. John's Wood, where they called on their good friend, the splendid veterinary surgeon. She came back with the wonderful news that the Pongos were shortly to become parents. Puppies were due in a month. Let us all go for a walk to celebrate, said Mr Dearly, after hearing the good news. Nanny Cook said the dinner was well ahead, and Nanny Butler said she could do with a bit of exercise, so off they all set along the outer circle. It was a beautiful September evening, windless and very peaceful. The park and the old cream-painted houses facing it basked in the golden light of sunset. There were many sounds, but no noises. The cries of playing children and the whir of London's traffic seemed quieter than usual, as if softened by the evening's gentleness. Birds were singing their last song of the day, and further along the circle, at the house where a great composer lived, someone was playing the piano. I shall always remember this happy walk, said Mr. Dearly. At that moment, the peace was shattered by an extremely strident motor horn. A large car was coming towards them. It drew up at a big house just ahead of them, and a tall woman came out onto the front door steps. She was wearing a tight-fitting emerald satin dress, several ropes of rubies, and an absolutely simple white mink cloak, which reached to the heels of her ruby-red shoes. She had a dark skin, black eyes with a tinge of red in them, and a very pointed nose. Her hair was parted severely down the middle, 
and one half of it was black and the other white. Rather unusual. Why, that's Cruella de Vil, said Mrs. Dearly. We were at school together. She was expelled for drinking ink. Isn't she a bit showy, said Mr. Dearly, and would have turned back. But the tall woman had seen Mrs. Dearly and came down the steps to meet her. So Mrs. Dearly had to introduce Mr. Dearly. Come in and meet my husband, said the tall woman. But you were going out, said Mrs. Dearly, looking at the chauffeur who was waiting at the open door of the large car. It was painted black and white in stripes, rather noticeable. No hurry at all. I insist on your coming. The nannies said they would get back and see about dinner and take the dogs with them. But the tall woman said the dogs must come in, too. They are so beautiful. I want my husband to see them, she said. What is your married name, Cruella? asked Mrs. Dearly, as they walked through a green marble hall into a red marble drawing room. My name is still Deville, said Cruella. I'm the last of my family, so I made my husband change his name to mine. Just then, the absolutely simple white mink cloak slipped from her shoulders to the floor. Mr. Dearly picked it up. What a beautiful cloak, he said, but you'll find it too warm for this evening. I never find anything too warm, said Cruella. I wear furs all the year round. I sleep between ermine sheets. How nice, said Mrs. Dearly politely. Do they wash well? Cruella did not seem to hear this. She went on, I worship furs. I live for furs. That's why I married a furrier. Then Mr. Deville came in. He was a small, worried-looking man who didn't seem to be anything beside a furrier. Cruella introduced him and then said, Where are those two delightful dogs? Pongo and Mrs. were sitting under the grand piano, feeling hungry. The red marble walls had made them think of slabs of raw meat. They're expecting puppies, said Mrs. Dearly happily. Oh, are they? Good, said Cruella. Come here, dogs. Pongo and Mrs. came forward politely. Wouldn't they make enchanting fur coats? said Cruella to her husband, for spring wear over a black suit. We've never thought of making coats out of dog skins. Pongo gave a sharp, menacing bark. It was only a joke, dear Pongo, said Mrs. Dearly, patting him. Then she said to Cruella, I sometimes think they understand every word we say. She did not really think it, but it was true. That is, it was true of Pongo, Mrs. did not understand quite so many human words as he did, but she understood Cruella's joke and thought it a very bad one. As for Pongo, he was furious. What a thing to say in front of his wife when she was expecting her first puppies. He was glad to see Mrs. was not upset. You must dine with us next Saturday, said Cruella to Mrs. Dearly. And as Mrs. Dearly could not think of a good excuse, she was very truthful, she accepted. Then she said they must not keep the Devilles any longer. As they went through the hall, a most beautiful white Persian cat dashed past them and ran upstairs. Mrs. Dearly admired it. Oh, I don't like her much, said Cruella. I'd drown her if she wasn't so valuable. The cat turned on the stairs and made an angry spitting noise. It might have been at Pongo and Mrs., but then again it might not. I want you to hear my new motor horn, said Cruella, as they all went down the front door steps. It's the loudest horn in England. She pushed past the chauffeur and sounded the horn herself, making it last a long time. Pongo and Mrs. were nearly deafened. Lovely, lovely dogs, Cruella said to them, as she got into the striped black and white car. You'd go so well with my car and my black and white hair. Then the chauffeur spread a sable rug over the Deville's knees and drove the striped car away. The golden sunset had gone now, and the blue twilight had come. The park was nearly empty, and a park keeper was calling, All out! All out! in a faraway voice. There was a faint scent of hay from the sun-scorched lawns, and a weedy, watery smell from the lake. The dearlies could see welcoming lights in their windows, and soon Pongo and Mrs. sniffed an exquisite smell of dinner. 
they all paused to look down through the iron railings at the kitchen. Although it was in the basement, this was not at all a dark kitchen. It had a door and two large windows opening onto one of the narrow paved yards which are so often found in front of old London houses. The correct name for these little basement yards is the area. A narrow flight of steps led up from the area to the street. I hope we haven't tired Mrs, said Mr Dearly, as he opened the front door with his latch key. Cruella de Vil's dinner party took place in a room with black marble walls on a white marble table. The food was rather unusual. The soup was dark purple. And what did it taste of? Pepper. The fish was bright green. And what did it taste of? Pepper. The meat was pale blue. And what did that taste of? Pepper. Everything tasted of pepper, even the ice cream, which was black. There were no other guests. After dinner, Mr and Mrs Dearly sat, panting, in the red marble drawing room, where an enormous fire was now burning. Mr Deville panted quite a bit too. Cruella, who was wearing a ruby satin dress with ropes of emeralds, got as close to the fire as she could. Make it blaze for me, she said to Mr Deville. Mr Deville made such a blaze that the Dearly thought the chimney would catch fire. Lovely, lovely, said Cruella, clapping her hands with delight. Ah, but the flames never last long enough. The minute they died down a little, she shivered and huddled herself in her absolutely simple white mink cloak. Mr and Mrs Dearly left as early as they felt was polite and walked along the outer circle trying to get cool. What a strange name Deville is, said Mr Dearly. If you put the two words together, they make devil. Perhaps Cruella's a lady devil. Perhaps that's why she likes things so hot. Mrs. Dearly smiled, for she knew he was only joking. Then she said, Oh dear, as we've dined with them, we must ask them to dine with us. And there are some other people we ought to ask. We'd better get it over before Mrs. has her puppies. Good gracious, what's that? Something soft was rubbing against her ankles. It's Cruella's cat, said Mr. Dearly. Go home, cat. You'll get lost. But the cat followed them all the way to their house. Perhaps she's hungry. Stroke her while I get her some food, said Mrs. Dearly. And she went down the area steps and into the kitchen. Soon she came up with some milk and half a tin of sardines. The white cat accepted both and then began to walk down the area steps. Does she want to live with us, said Mrs. Dearly. It seemed as if the white cat did. But just then, Pongo woke up and barked loudly. The white cat turned and walked away into the night. Just as well, said Mr. Dearly, Cruella would have the law on us if we took her valuable cat. It must have been about three weeks later that Mrs. began to behave in a very peculiar manner. She explored every inch of the house, paying particular attention to cupboards and boxes. And the place that interested her most was the broom cupboard, just outside the dearly's bedroom. Bless me, she wants to have her puppies there, said Nanny Cook. Not in that dark, stuffy cupboard, Mrs. Love, said Nanny Butler. You need light and air. But when Mrs. Dearly consulted the splendid veterinary surgeon, he said what Mrs. needed most was a small, enclosed space where she would feel safe. And if she fancied the broom cupboard, the broom cupboard she'd better have. And she'd better have it at once and get used to it, even though the puppies were not expected for some days. I hope this dinner party won't upset Mrs., said Mr. Dearly, when he came home and found Mrs. settled in the cupboard. I shall be glad when it's over. As there were quite a lot of guests, the food had to be normal, but Mrs. Dearly kindly put tall pepper grinders in front of the Devilles. Cruella ground so much pepper that most of the guests were sneezing, but Mr. Deville used no pepper at all and he ate much more than in his own house. Cruella was busy peppering her fruit salad when Nanny Butler came in and whispered to Mrs Dearly. Mrs Dearly looked startled, asked the guest to excuse her and hurried out. A few minutes later, Nanny Butler came in again and whispered to Mr Dearly. He looked startled, excused himself and hurried out. Those guests who were not sneezing made polite conversation. Then Nanny Butler came in again. Ladies and gentlemen, she said dramatically, 
puppies are arriving earlier than expected. Mr and Mrs Dearly ask you to remember that Mrs has never before been a mother. She needs absolute quiet. There was an instant silence, broken only by a stifled sneeze. Then the guests rose, drank a whispered toast to the young mother and tiptoed from the house. All except Cruella de Vil. When she reached the hall, she heard the Dearly's voices and ran upstairs. I must, I must see the darling puppies, she cried. The cupboard door was a little open. The Dearly's were inside, soothing Mrs. Cruella flung open the door and stared down at the three puppies. But they're mongrels, all white, no spots at all, she cried. You must drown them at once. Dalmatians are always born white, said Mr. Dearly, glaring at Cruella. The spots come later. And we wouldn't drown them even if they were mongrels, said Mrs. Dearly indignantly. It'd be quite easy, said Cruella. I've drowned dozens and dozens of my cat's kittens. She always chooses some wretched alley cat for their father, so they're never worth keeping. Surely you leave her one kitten, said Mrs. Dearly. If I'd done that, I'd be overrun with cats, said Cruella. Are you sure those horrid little white rats are pure Dalmatian puppies? Quite sure, snapped Mr. Dearly. Now please go away, you're upsetting Mrs. How long will it be before the puppies are old enough to leave their mother? asked Cruella, in case I want to buy some. Seven or eight weeks, said Mr. Dearly, but there won't be any for sale. Then he shut the cupboard door in Cruella's face, and Nanny Butler firmly showed her out of the house. Nanny Cook was busy telephoning the splendid vet, but he was out on another case. His wife said she would tell him as soon as he came home, and there was no need to worry. It sounded as if Mrs. was getting on very well. She certainly was. There was now a fourth puppy. Mrs. washed it, then Mr. Dearly dried it, while Mrs. Dearly gave Mrs. a drink of warm milk. Then the pup was put in with the other three, in a basket placed where Mrs. could see it. Soon she had a fifth puppy, then a sixth, and a seventh. The night wore on. Eight puppies, nine puppies. Surely that would be all. Dalmatians do not often have more in their first family. Ten puppies, eleven puppies. Then the twelfth arrived, and it did not look like its brothers and sisters. The flesh showing through its white hair was not a healthy pink, but a sickly yellow, and instead of kicking its little legs, it lay quite still. The nannies, who were sitting just outside the cupboard, told Mr and Mrs Dearly that it had been born dead. But with so many, its mother will never miss it, said Nanny Cook comfortingly. Mr. Dearly held the tiny creature in the palm of his hand and looked at it sorrowfully. It isn't fair it should have no life at all, said Mrs. Dearly with tears in her eyes. Something he had once read came back to Mr. Dearly. He began to massage the puppy. Then he tousled it gently in a towel. And suddenly there was a faint hint of pink around its nose, then its whole little body was flushed with pink beneath its snowy hair. Its legs moved. Its mouth opened. It was alive. Mr. Dearly quickly put it close to Mrs. so that she could give it some milk at once, and it stayed there, feeding, until the next puppy arrived. For arrive it did. That made thirteen. Shortly before dawn, the front doorbell rang. It was the splendid vet who had been up all night saving the life of a dog that had been run over. By then, all the puppies had been born, and Mrs was giving breakfast to eight of them, all she could manage at one time. Excellent, said the splendid vet. A really magnificent family. And how is the father bearing up? Poor Pongo. We must have him up, said Mrs Dearly. But the splendid vet said mother dogs did not usually like to have father dogs around when puppies had just been born. At that moment, there was a clatter of toenails on the polished floor of the hall, and upstairs, four at a time, came Pongo. Nanny Cook had just gone down to make some tea for the splendid vet, and the anxious father had streaked past her the minute she opened the kitchen door. C careful, Pongo, said the splendid vet. She may not want you. But Mrs. was weakly thumping her tail. Go down and have your breakfast and a good sleep, she said. But nobody except Pongo heard a sound. His eyes and his wildly wagging tail told her all he was feeling, his love for her and those eight fine pups enjoying their first breakfast, 
and those others in the basket waiting their turn. How many were there? It's a pity dogs can't count, said Mrs. Dearly. But Pongo could count perfectly. He went downstairs with his head high and a new light in his fine dark eyes, for he knew himself to be the proud father of fifteen. And now, said the splendid vet to the Dearlies, you must get a foster mother. He explained that though Mrs. would do her best to feed fifteen puppies, doing so would make her terribly thin and tired, and the strong puppies would get more milk than the weak ones. The puppy Mr. Dearly had brought to life was very small and would need special care. The largest pup of all had a black patch all over its ear and one side of its face. Until the spots started to come through some weeks later, the big puppy with the patch and the small delicate puppy were the only ones who could be told apart from the others. The splendid vet said the foster mother would have to be some poor dog who had lost her own puppies but still had milk to give. He thought he could get such a dog, but as he wasn't sure, the dearlies had better telephone all the lost dogs' homes. And until the foster mother was found, they could help Mrs. by feeding the pups with a doll's feeding bottle. Then the splendid vet went home for an hour's sleep before starting his day's work. As soon as the shops opened, Mrs. Dearly went out and bought two feeding bottles. And then Mr. Dearly and the nannies took turns at feeding puppies. Mrs. Dearly fancied this job herself, but was busy telephoning, trying to find a foster mother. It was late afternoon before she heard of a mother dog with some milk to give, nearly 30 miles from London. And this dog had only just been brought in, and would have to be kept some days in case she was claimed. Mr. Dearly put his head out of the cupboard. After being up all night and feeding pups all day, he was beginning to feel pretty tired, but he was determined to go on helping Mrs. until the foster mother arrived. Why not go and see if you can borrow that dog, he said. Say we'll give it back if its owner turns up. So Mrs. Dearly got the car from the old stable at the back of the house and drove off, hopefully. But when she got to the dog's home, she found that the mother dog had already been claimed. She was glad for the dog's sake, but terribly disappointed. It was now almost dark, a gloomy, wet October evening. It had been raining all afternoon, but Mrs. Dearly hadn't minded when she was feeling hopeful. Now, as she started back for London, the weather made her feel more and more depressed. She was driving across a lonely stretch of common when she saw what looked like a bundle lying in the road ahead of her. She slowed down, and as she drew closer, she saw that it was not a bundle, but a dog. Instantly, she thought it must have been run over. Dreading what she might find, she stopped the car and got out. At first, she thought the dog was dead, but as she bent down, it struggled to its feet, showing no signs of injury. It was so plastered with mud that she could not see what kind of a dog it was. What she could see, by the light from the car's headlights, was the poor creature's pitiful thinness. She spoke to it gently. Its drooping tail gave a feeble flick, then drooped again. I can't leave it here, thought Mrs. Dearly. Even if it hasn't been run over, it must be near starvation. Oh, dear. With seventeen dogs at home already, she had no wish to take back a stray, but she knew she would never bring herself just to hand this poor thing in at a police station. She patted it and tried to get it to follow her. It was willing to, but its legs were so wobbly that she picked it up and carried it to the car. Then she saw that this was a mother dog and that in spite of its starving condition, it still had some milk to give. She knew it would take her some time to get home because of the traffic, so she stopped at a little restaurant. Here the owner let her buy some milk and some cold meat and lent her his own dog's dishes. The starving dog ate and drank ravenously, then at once settled to sleep. The nice owner of the restaurant took back his dishes and wished Mrs. Dearly luck as she drove away. She got home just as the splendid vet was arriving to see Mrs. and the puppies. He carried the stray dog in and down to the warm kitchen. After a careful examination, he said he thought her thinness was due more to having had puppies than to long starvation and that if she was fed well, the milk intended for her own puppies might continue. He guessed they had been taken away from her, and she had got lost looking for them. The splendid vet said a bath was a good idea, so the dog was carried into the little room which had been fitted up as a laundry. Nanny Cook got on with the bath as fast as she could, because she was afraid Mr. Dearly might want to do the job himself. 
Mrs. Dearley had gone upstairs to tell him what was happening. The stray seemed delighted with the warm water. She had just been covered with soap when Pongo came back from a walk with Nanny Butler and ran through the open door of the laundry. He won't hurt a lady, said the splendid vet. I should hope not when she's going to help nurse his puppies, said Nanny Cook. Pongo stood on his hind legs and kissed the wet dog on the nose, telling her how glad he was to see her and how grateful his wife would be. But no human heard him. The stray said, Well, I'll do my best, but I can't promise anything. No human heard that either. Just then Mr. Dearley came hurrying in to see the new arrival. What kind of a dog is she? he asked. At that moment, Nanny Cook began to rinse off the soap, and everyone gave a gasp. This dog was a Dalmatian too. But her spots, instead of being black, were brown, which in Dalmatians is called not brown, but liver. Eighteen Dalmatians under one roof, said Mr. Dearley gloatingly. Couldn't be better. But it could, as he one day was to learn. Wet, the poor liver-spotted dog looked thinner than ever. We'll call her Perdita, said Mrs. Dearley, and explained to the nannies that this was after a character in Shakespeare. She was lost, and the Latin word for lost is Perditus. Then she patted Pongo, who was looking particularly intelligent, and said anyone would think he understood. Perdita was dried in front of the kitchen fire and given another meal. The splendid vet said she ought to start mothering puppies as soon as possible to encourage her to provide more milk. So after she was quite dry and had taken a nap, two puppies were removed from the cupboard while Mrs. went out for a little air. Perdita had the basket Mrs. usually slept in. She fed and washed them, and when the two puppies were asleep, Perdita told Pongo her story. She had been born in a large country house, not far from the common where Mrs. Dearley had found her. Although very pretty, she had been less valuable than her brothers and sisters. Her spots were rather small, and her tail inclined to curl. It had straightened as she grew older. As no one rich or important wanted to be her pet, she was given to a farmer, who, though not cruel to her, never gave her the love all Dalmatians need. And he let her run wild, which is not good for any kind of dog. A time came when she felt a great desire to marry, but no marriage was arranged for her, and as the farm was over a mile from any village, no dogs had come courting her. So one day she set out to find a husband for herself. Her way to the village lay across the common, where she saw a large, handsome car which had been driven onto the grass. A group of people were having a picnic, and with them was a superb liver-spotted Dalmatian. At that moment he saw Perdita. It was love at first sight. He came bounding to her, and they were away into a wood together before anyone could stop them. Here they made swift arrangements for their marriage, promising to love each other always. Then the happy husband told his wife she must, of course, come and live with him, and led her back to the common. But as they reached it, along came the farmer Perdita lived with, in his rattling old car. He dragged her into it, and the picnic party bundled her husband into their car. Both dogs struggled and howled, but it was useless. The cars drove off in opposite directions. Nine weeks after her marriage, Perdita had eight puppies. The farmer did not give her extra food or help to feed the puppies himself, so she got thinner and thinner. By the time her family was a month old, she was just skin and bone. Then the farmer put down some food for the puppies to eat, and they quickly learned how to, but they still went on taking all the milk Perdita could give them, so she never had a chance to regain her weight. She was such a very young mother, barely full-grown herself, but she loved her babies dearly and did all she could for them. And as she got thinner, they got fatter. The spots on Dalmatians begin to come through after two weeks. By the time Perdita's family were six weeks old, it was obvious that they were to be beautifully marked and very valuable, Perdita heard the farmer say so to a stranger who came to the farm one morning. That afternoon, she woke to find not one puppy in bed with her. She searched the farmhouse, she searched the farmyard. No puppies anywhere. She ran onto the road, fearing they might have been run over. On and on she went, pausing every few minutes to bark. No answering puppy bark came to her. Soon it began to rain. 
She thought of the puppies all getting wet and barked more and more desperately. A car nearly ran over her. She only saved herself by jumping into a muddy ditch where the mud even got into her eyes and ears. By the time she reached the common where she had met her husband, she was shivering and weak on her legs. She had eaten nothing since the previous afternoon. The farmer only gave her one meal a day. At last, faint with hunger and utterly broken-spirited, she collapsed. And there, not long after, Mrs. Dearly found her. Pongo sympathised with all his heart and did his best to comfort her. He said he did not think the puppies were lost. It was more likely that they had been sold, perhaps to the stranger who had come to see them. And this might be the best thing that could have happened to them, for if they were valuable, they were sure to be well taken care of. There would never have been enough food at the farm for them when they got really big. Perdita knew all this was true, and the two tiny puppies in the basket with her were wonderfully comforting. So were the kind things Pongo said about being grateful to her for feeding them. Soon she felt much happier and slid into a warm, well-fed sleep. Up in the cupboard, Mrs. had just served supper for eight and was a trifle tired. Mr. Dearly had just served supper for five and was so exhausted by his day of puppy feeding that he had to crawl out of the cupboard on his hands and knees. Mrs. Dearly got him to bed and fed him with hot milk from a thermos. They slept with their door open, in case Mrs. needed anything, but she was very peaceful. On the top floor, Nanny Cook slept, dreaming of Dalmatian puppies dressed as babies, and Nanny Butler slept dreaming of babies dressed as Dalmatian puppies. What with four humans, three dogs and fifteen puppies, it really was a very sleepful house. The next day, Five more puppies were brought down to Perdita, and she fed them splendidly. And ten days after that, the puppies' spots began to show. What a day it was when Mr. Dearly sighted the first spot. After that, spots came thick and fast. In a very few days, it was possible to recognise every pup by its spots. There were seven girls and eight boys. The prettiest of all the girls was the tiny pup whose life Mr. Dearly had saved at birth, but she was very small and delicate. When pigs have families, the smallest, weakest piglet is often called the cad pig. Mr. Dearly always called the tiny puppy cad pig, which can be a nice little name when spoken with love. Patch, the pup born with the black ear, was still the biggest and strongest puppy. He always seemed to be next to the cad pig, as if these two already knew they were going to be special friends. There was a fat, funny boy puppy called Roly-Poly, who was always getting into mischief. And the most striking pup of all was one who had a perfect horseshoe of spots on his back and had therefore been named Lucky. He was terrifically energetic and showed from the beginning that he was going to be the ringleader of all his brothers and sisters. Every day now the puppies grew stronger and more independent. They now fed themselves entirely, eating minced meat as well as soaked bread and milk puddings. Mrs. and Perdita were quite happy to leave them now for an hour or more at a time, so the three grown-up dogs took Mrs. Dearly and Nanny Butler for a good walk in the park every morning while Nanny Cook got the lunch and kept an eye on the puppies. One morning, when she had just let them out into the area, the front doorbell rang. It was Cruella de Vil. And when she heard Mrs. Dearly was out, she said she would come in and wait. She asked many questions about the Dearlies and the puppies, and went on talking so long that at last Nanny Cook said she really must go down and let the puppies in as a cold wind was blowing. Cruella then said she would walk in the park and hope to meet Mrs. Dearly. Perhaps I can see her from here, she said, strolling to the window. Nanny Cook also went to the window, intending to point out the nearest way into the park. As she did so, she noticed a small black van standing in front of the house. At that very moment, it drove off at a great pace. Cruella suddenly seemed in a hurry. She almost ran out of the house and down the front doorsteps. Can't think how she can move so fast, huddled in all those furs, thought Nanny Cook, closing the front door. Oh, and those poor pups in only their own thin little skins catching their death of cold. It was late December now. Christmas was not far off. She hurried down to the kitchen and opened the door to the area. Not a pup in sight. They're playing.
playing me a trick. They're hiding, Nanny Cook told herself. But she knew there was nowhere for fifteen puppies to hide. All the same, she looked behind every tub of shrubs where not even a mouse could have hidden. The gate at the top of the steps was firmly closed and no pup could possibly have opened it. Still, she ran up to the street and searched wildly. They've been stolen. I know they have, she moaned, bursting into tears. They must have been in that black van I saw driving away. Cruella de Vil seemed to have changed her mind about going into the park. She was already halfway back to her own house, walking very fast indeed. Through her tears, Nanny Cook stared towards the park. She could now see Mrs. Dearly, Nanny Butler and the three dogs, who had just turned for home. It seemed a strange and terrible thing that they should be strolling along so happily when every step brought them nearer to such dreadful news. As they came across the outer circle, Nanny Cook ran to meet them, crying so much that Mrs. Dearly found it hard to understand what had happened. The dogs heard the word puppies, saw Nanny Cook's tears, and rushed down to the area. Then they went dashing over the whole house, searching, searching. Every few minutes, Mrs. and Perdita howled, and Pongo barked furiously. While the dogs searched and the nannies cried on each other's shoulders, Mrs. Dearly telephoned Mr. Dearly. He came home at once, bringing with him one of the top men from Scotland Yard. The top man found a bit of sacking on the area railings and said the puppies must have been dropped into sacks and driven away in the black van. He promised to comb the underworld, but warned the dearlies that stolen dogs were seldom recovered unless a reward was offered. A reward seemed an unreasonable thing to offer to a thief, but Mr. Dearly was willing to offer it. He rushed to Fleet Street and had large advertisements put on the front pages of the evening newspapers. This was rather expensive, and arranged for even larger advertisements to be on the front pages of the next day's morning papers. This was even more expensive. Beyond this, there seemed nothing he or Mrs. Dearly could do except try to comfort each other and comfort the nannies and the dogs. Soon the nannies stopped crying and joined in the comforting and prepared beautiful meals which nobody felt like eating. And at last, night fell on the stricken household. Anyone who did not know Pongo well would have thought him handsome, amusing and charming, but not particularly clever. Even the dearlies did not quite realise the depths of his mind. He was often still so puppyish. He would run after balls and sticks, climb into laps far too small to hold him, and roll over on his back to have his stomach scratched. How was anyone to guess that this playful creature owned one of the keenest brains in dogdom? It was at work now. All through the long December night, he put two and two together and made four. Once or twice, he almost made five. He was still planning when the nannies came down to start another day. As a rule, this was a splendid time, with the fire freshly made, plenty of food around and the puppies at their most playful. This morning, well, as Nanny Butler said, it just didn't bear thinking about. But she thought about it and so did everybody else in that pupless house. No good news came during the day, but the dearlies were surprised and relieved to find the dogs ate well. Pongo had been firm. You girls have got to keep your strength up. And there was an even greater surprise in the afternoon. Pongo and Mrs. showed very plainly that they wanted to take the dearlies for a walk. Perdita did not. She was determined to stay at home in case any pup returned and was in need of a wash. It was very cold, so Mrs. was put into her beautiful blue coat. Pongo would never wear his. From the first, it was quite clear the dogs knew just where they wanted to go. Very firmly, they led the way right across the park, across the road, and to the open space which is called Primrose Hill. This did not surprise the dearlies, as it had always been a favourite walk. What did surprise them was the way Pongo and Mrs. behaved when they got to the top of the hill. They stood side by side and they barked. They barked to the north, they barked to the south, they barked to the east and west. And each time they changed their positions, they began barking with three very strange, short, sharp barks. Many people must have noticed how dogs like to bark in the early evening. 
Indeed, twilight has sometimes been called dog's barking time. Busy town dogs bark less than country dogs, but all dogs know all about the twilight barking. It is their way of keeping in touch with distant friends, passing on important news, enjoying a good gossip. But none of the dogs who answered Pongo and Mrs. expected to enjoy a gossip, for the three short, sharp barks meant, help, help, help. No dog sends that signal unless the need is desperate, and no dog who hears it ever fails to respond. Within a few minutes, the news of the stolen puppies was travelling across England, and every dog who heard at once turned detective. Dogs living in London's underworld, hard-bitten characters, also hard-biting, set out to explore sinister alleys where dog thieves lurk. Dogs in pet shops hastened to make quite sure all puppies offered for sale were not Dalmatians in disguise. And dogs who could do nothing else swiftly handed on the news, spreading it through London and on through the suburbs and on, on to the open country. Help, help, help. Fifteen Dalmatian puppies stolen. Send news to Pongo and Mrs Pongo of Regent's Park, London. End of message. Pongo and Mrs hoped all this would be happening, but all they really knew was that they had made contact with the dogs near enough to answer them and that those dogs would be standing by at twilight the next evening to relay any news that had come along. One Great Dane, over towards Hampstead, was particularly encouraging. I have a chain of friends all over England, he said in his great booming bark, and I will be on duty day and night. Courage, courage, O oh dogs of Regent's Park. It was almost dark now, and the dearies were suggesting, very gently, that they should be taken home. So after a few last words with the Great Dane, Pongo and Mrs. led the way down Primrose Hill. The dogs who had answered them were silent now, but the twilight barking was spreading in an ever-widening circle. And tonight it would not end with twilight. It would go on and on as the moon rose high over England. The next day, just before dusk, Pongo and Mrs. again showed that they wished to take the dearlies for a walk. So off they started, and again the dogs led the way to the top of Primrose Hill. And again they stood side by side and gave three sharp barks. But this time, though no human ear could have detected it, they were slightly different barks. And they meant not help, 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 but ready, ready, ready. The dogs who collected news from all over London replied first. Reports had come from the West End and the East End and south of the Thames, and all these reports were the same. Calling Pongo and Mrs Pongo of Regent's Park. No news of your puppies. Deepest regrets. End of message. Again and again, Pongo and Mrs barked the ready signal, each time with fresh hope. Again and again came bitter disappointment. At last, only the Great Dane over towards Hampstead remained to be heard from. They signalled to him their last hope. Back came his booming bark. Calling Pongo and Mrs Pongo. News, news at last. Stand by to receive details. A most wonderful thing had happened. A Pomeranian with a piercing yap had got a message through to him. She had heard it from a poodle, who had heard it from a boxer, who had heard it from a Pekingese. Dogs of almost every known breed had helped to carry the news, and a great many dogs of unknown breed, none the worse for that and all of them bright as buttons. In all, 480 dogs had relayed the message, which had travelled over 60 miles as the dog barks. Each dog had given the urgent signal, which had silenced all gossiping dogs. Not that many dogs were merely gossiping that night. Almost all the twilight barking had been about the missing puppies. This was the strange story that now came through to Pongo and Mrs. In a remote Suffolk village was an old house completely surrounded by an unusually high wall. Two brothers named Saul and Jasper Baden lived there, but were merely caretakers for the real owner. The place had an evil reputation. No local dog will have dreamed of putting its nose inside the tall iron gates. In any case, these gates were always kept locked. It so happened that an elderly English sheepdog's walk took him past this house. He quickened his pace, having no wish to meet either of the Badens. And at that moment, something came sailing out over the high wall. It was a bone, the sheepdog saw with pleasure, but not a bone with meat on it, he noted with disgust. 
It was an old, dry bone, and on it were some peculiar scratches. The scratches formed letters, and the letters were S.O.S. Someone was asking for help. Someone behind the tall wall and the high, chained gates. The sheepdog barked a low, cautious bark. He was answered by a high, shrill bark. Then he heard a yelp, as if some dog had been cuffed. The sheepdog barked again, saying, I'll do all I can. Then he picked up the bone in his teeth and raced back to the farm. Once home, he showed the bone to a tabby cat and asked her help. Then together, they hurried to the lonely house. At the back, they found a tree whose branches reached over the wall. The cat climbed the tree, went along its branches, and then leapt to a tree the other side of the wall. Take care of yourself, barked the sheepdog. Remember those bad and brothers are villains. The cat clawed her way down, backwards to the ground, then hurried through the overgrown shrubbery. Soon she came to an old brick wall which enclosed a stable yard. From behind the wall came whimperings and snufflings. She leapt to the top of the wall and looked down. The next second, one of the Baden brothers saw her and threw a stone at her. She dodged it, jumped from the wall and ran for her life. In two minutes she was safely back with the sheepdog. They're there, she said triumphantly. The place is seething with Dalmatian puppies. The sheepdog was a formidable twilight barker. Tonight, with the most important news in dogdom to send out, he surpassed himself. And so the message travelled, by way of farm dogs and house dogs, great dogs and small dogs, across miles and miles of country, across miles and miles of suburbs, across a network of London streets the chain held firm, from the depths of Suffolk to the top of Primrose Hill, where Pongo and Mrs, still as statues, stood listening listening. Puppies found in lonely house. S.O.S. on old bone. Mrs. could not take it all in, but Pongo missed nothing. There were instructions for reaching the village, suggestions for the journey, offers of hospitality on the way. And the dog chain was standing by to take a message back to the pups. The sheepdog would bark it over the wall in the dead of night. At first, Mrs. was too excited to think of anything to say, but Pongo barked clearly, Tell them we're coming. Tell them we start tonight. Tell them to be brave. So they signed off, and there was a sudden silence. And then, though not quite so loudly, they heard the Great Dane again. But this time he was not barking towards them. What they heard was their message, starting on its way to Suffolk. At eleven o'clock, the dogs gave Mrs. Dearley's hands one last kiss and took Mr. Dearley out for his last run. Perdita joined them for this. She had spent the evening with the two nannies, feeling that Pongo and Mrs. might wish to be alone with their pets. Then all three dogs went to their baskets in the warm kitchen, and the house settled for the night. But it did not settle for long. Shortly before midnight, Pongo and Mrs. got up, ate some biscuits they had hidden, and took long drinks of water. Then they said a loving goodbye to Perdita, who was in tears, nosed open a window at the back of the house, and got out into the mews. After a few minutes, they were nearly at the bridge which leads from the outer circle towards Camden Town. As they ran towards the bridge, Mrs.'s heart gave a wild flutter. Coming towards them was a policeman. Instantly, Pongo led the way into a back street, and they were soon safely out of the policeman's sight. But seeing him had reminded Mrs. of something. Oh, Pongo, she wailed. We are illegal. We are out without our collars. And a good thing, too, said Pongo, for a dog can be grabbed by the collar. But I do wish we could have brought your coat. I don't, said Mrs. Bravely, for if I wore a coat, how should I know how cold the puppies were? They have no coats. Oh, Pongo, how can they make the journey from Suffolk in such wintry weather? Suppose it snows. They may not have to make the journey yet, said Pongo. Mrs. stared in astonishment. But we must get them back quickly or the dog thieves will sell them. Nothing will happen to them yet, said Pongo. And now he knew it was time to tell his wife the truth. Let's rest a moment, he said, and led Mrs. into the shelter of a doorway. Then he went on gently. Did you hear who owns the house where the puppies are imprisoned? Mrs. said, No, Pongo, I'm afraid I missed many things the Great Dane barked. Dear Mrs., our puppies were not stolen by ordinary dog thieves. 
They are at Hell Hall, the ancestral home of Cruella de Vil. She had them stolen to be made into a fur coat. Oh, Mrs. Be Brave. He never told her that the SOS on the old bone meant save our skins. Mrs. had collapsed. She lay on the doorstep, panting, her eyes full of horror. But it will be all right, dear Mrs. They will be safe for months yet. They're much too small to be... to be used for a fur coat yet. Mrs. shuddered. Then she struggled to her feet. I will go back, she cried. I will go back and tear Cruella de Vil to pieces. That would do no good at all, said Pongo firmly. We must rescue the puppies first and think of our revenge later. On to Suffolk. On to Suffolk, then, said Mrs., staggering along on shaky legs. But we shall come back, Cruella de Vil. Soon Mrs. began to feel better, for Pongo made her see that puppies whose skins were wanted for a fur coat would be well fed and well taken care of and kept together. Ordinary dog thieves might have sold them already and to different people. Pongo had no difficulty in taking the right road out of London, for he and Mr. Dearly had done much motoring in their bachelor days and often driven to Suffolk. At last London was left behind, and just before dawn they reached a village in Epping Forest where they hoped to spend the day. They had decided they must always travel by night and rest during the daylight, for they felt sure Mr. Dearly would advertise their loss and the police would be on the lookout for them. There was far less chance of their being seen and caught by night. They had barely entered the sleeping village when they heard a quiet bark. The next moment, a burly golden retriever was greeting them. Pongo and Mrs. Pongo, I presume? All arrangements were made for you by late twilight barking. Please follow me. He led them to an old gabled inn, and then under an archway to a cobbled yard. Please drink here, at my own bowl, he said. Food awaits you in your sleeping quarters, but water could not be arranged, for no dog can carry a full water bowl. Pongo and Mrs. had only had one drink since they left home, at an old drinking trough for horses, which had a lowered trough for dogs. They now gulped thirstily and gratefully. At the end of the yard were some old stables and an old coach, just the right place for Dalmatians, said Pongo, smiling, for our ancestors were trained to run behind coaches and carriages. Some people still call us coach dogs or carriage dogs. There was a deep bed of straw on the floor of the coach, and neatly laid out on the seat were two magnificent chops, half a dozen iced cakes, and a box of peppermint creams. From the butcher's dog, the baker's dog, and the dog at the sweet shop, said the retriever. I shall arrange your dinner. We'll... Steak be satisfactory? Pongo and Mrs. said it would indeed, and tried to thank him for everything, but he waved their thanks away, saying, My youngest lad's already on guard. He's hoping to see you for a moment uh, when you're rested and ask for your paw marks to start his collection. A small guard of honour will see you out of the village, but I shan't let them waste too much of your time. Good night. That's really good morning. Pleasant dreams. As soon as he'd gone, Pongo and Mrs. ate ravenously. Then they settled down in the straw, close together, and got warmer and warmer. How gloriously they slept. It was their first really deep sleep since the loss of the puppies. Even the twilight barking did not disturb them. It brought good news, which the retriever told them when he woke them, as soon as it was dark. All was well with the pups, and Lucky sent a message that they were getting more food than they could eat. This gave Pongo and Mrs. a wonderful appetite for the steaks that were waiting for them. The steaks were finished and a nice piece of cheese was going down well when the corgi from the post office arrived with an evening paper in her mouth. Mr. Dearly had put in his largest advertisement yet with a photograph of Pongo and Mrs. Pongo's heart sank, for he felt the route planned for them was no longer safe. It had led through many villages, where even by night they might be noticed, unless they waited till all humans had gone to bed, which would waste too much time. He said... We must travel across country. But you'll get lost, said the retriever's wife. Pongo never loses his way, said Mrs. Proudly. And the moon will be nearly full, but it will be hard to pick up food. I had arranged for it to await you in several villages. Never mind, I can cancel it by the nine o'clock barking, said the retriever. There was a snuffling at the back door of the stable. All the dogs of the village had arrived to see Pongo and Mrs. off. We should start at once, said Pongo. Where's our young friend who wants poor marks? 
the retriever's youngest lad stepped forward shyly, carrying an old menu. Pongo and Mrs. put their portographs on the back of it for him, then thanked the retriever and his family for all they had done, and bowed right and left most gratefully. Then they were off across the moonlit fields. On to Suffolk, said Pongo. They were well rested and well fed, and they soon reached a pond where they could drink. The retriever had told them to be on the lookout for it. It would not have been safe for them to drink from his bowl again. Too many humans were now about. And their spirits were far higher than when they had left the house in Regent's Park. How far away it already seemed, although it was less than twenty-four hours since they had been in their baskets by the kitchen fire. Of course, they were still anxious about their puppies, and sorry for the poor dearlies. But, as Pongo said, worrying would help nobody, while enjoying their freedom to race across the fields would do them a par of good. They ran on, shoulder to shoulder, a perfectly matched couple. The night was windless, and therefore seemed warmer than the night before, but Pongo knew there was a heavy frost, and when, after a couple of hours across the fields, they came to another pond, there was a film of ice over it. They broke this easily and drank, but Pongo began to be a little anxious about where they would be by daybreak, for they would need good shelter in such cold weather. As they were now travelling across country, he thought it unlikely they would find the village that had been expecting them, but he felt sure that by now most dogs would have heard of them and would be willing to help. Only we must be near some village by dawn, or we shall meet no dogs, he thought. He did not tell Mrs. of his fears. Surely there would be a village soon, or a fair-sized farm. Should we rest a little, Pongo? said Mrs. at last. Not until we found some dogs to help us, Mrs., said Pongo. Then his heart gave a glad leap. Ahead of them was a path through a wood that led to a house. It was very old, built of mellow red brick with many little diamond-paned windows and one great window that reached almost to the roof. The windows twinkling in the early morning sunshine looked cheerful and welcoming, but there was no sign of life anywhere, and there was grass growing in the cracks of the wide stone steps which led to the massive oak door. It's empty, thought Mrs. in despair. But it was not empty. Looking out of an open window was a spaniel, black except for his muzzle, which was grey with age. Good morning, he said most courteously. Can I be of any help to you? It was wonderful how quickly the spaniel took in their story, for he had not heard any news by way of the twilight barking. Haven't listened to it for years, he said. Indeed, I doubt if I could get it now. There isn't another dog for miles. Anyway, Sir Charles needs me at twilight. He needs me almost all the time. I'm only off duty now because he's in his bath. They were now in a large stone-floored kitchen, where the spaniel had led them after inviting them to jump through the window. He went on, "'Breakfast before you tell me any more,' and led them to a large plate of meat. "'Surely it's your breakfast, sir,' said Pongo. "'Had mine with Sir Charles. Don't as a rule take breakfast, but I accepted a couple of slices of bacon. Sir Charles was so pleased. "'Go ahead, my dear chap, I couldn't eat another bite.' So they ate and ate, and drank and drank. "'And now for a long sleep,' said the spaniel. He led them up a back staircase and along many passages till they came to a large sunny bedroom in which was a four-poster bed. Beside it was a round basket. Mine, said the spaniel, but I never use it. Sir Charles likes me on the bed. Luckily John, he's our valet, is off for his day out. Jump up, both of you. Pongo and Mrs. jumped on the four-poster bed and relaxed in bliss. No one will come up here until this evening, said the spaniel, because Sir Charles can't manage the stairs until John gets back. Sleep well, my children. The sunlight and the tapestried walls were so beautiful that it seemed a waste not to stay awake and enjoy them. So they did, for nearly a whole minute. The next thing they knew was that the spaniel was gently waking them. The sun was already down and the room a little chilly. Pongo and Mrs. stretched sleepily. Come with me now, the spaniel whispered, for John will soon be back to get supper. They tiptoed out of the vast dark room and made their way to the kitchen, where the spaniel pressed more food on them. Just a few substantial biscuits. My tin is always left open for me when John is away. Then they had a last drink of water, and the spaniel gave Pongo directions for reaching Suffolk. 
It was full of rights and lefts, and Mrs. did not take in one word. The spaniel noticed her dazed look and said playfully, Now, which is your right, Paul? One of the front ones, said Mrs. brightly, at which Pongo and the spaniel laughed in a very masculine way. Then they thanked the spaniel and said goodbye. Mrs. said she would always remember that day. So shall I, said the spaniel, smiling at her. Ah, Pongo, what a lucky dog you are. I know it, said Pongo, looking proudly at Mrs. Then they were off. After they'd been running across the field for some minutes, Mrs. said anxiously, Pongo, how far away from the puppies are we now? With good luck we should reach them tomorrow morning, said Pongo. Just before midnight they came to the market town of Sudbury. Pongo paused as they crossed the bridge over the River Star. Here we enter Suffolk, he said triumphantly. They ran on through the quiet streets of old houses and into the market square. They had hoped they might meet some dog and hear if any news of the puppies had come at the twilight barking, but not so much as a cat was stirring. While they were drinking at the fountain, church clocks began to strike midnight. Mrs. said gladly, Oh, Pongo, it's tomorrow. Now we shall be with our puppies today. And on they went. I'm so afraid we may go through our village without knowing it, Pongo said, for as we have not been able to send any news by the twilight barking, nobody will be on the lookout for us. But he was wrong. Suddenly, out of the darkness, came a loud meow. They stopped instantly. Just ahead of them, up a tree, was a tabby cat. She said, Pongo and Mrs., I suppose you are friendly? Yes, indeed, madam, said Pongo. Are you by any chance the cat who helped to find our puppies? That's me, said the cat. Oh, thank you, thank you, cried Mrs. The cat jumped down. Sorry to seem suspicious of you, but some dogs just can't control themselves when they see a cat. Not that I've ever had any trouble. Well, here you are. How very kind of you to keep watch for us, madam, said Pongo. No hardship. I'm usually out at night. You can call me Tib. My real name's Pussy Willow, but that's too long for most people. A pity, really, as it's a name I could fancy. Now you'll be wanting a bite of food and a good long rest. Please tell us if all is still well with our puppies, said Mrs. It was yesterday afternoon when I last saw them. Lively as crickets and fat as butter they were. But you won't be able to see the puppies until they are let out for exercise, and that'll be ours yet. Those bad uns are late risers. So come along and meet the Colonel. A human Colonel? asked Mrs. Puzzled. Bless me, no. The Colonel's our sheepdog, a perfect master of strategy. You ask the sheep. He calls me his lieutenant. The cat was now leading them along the road. Pongo asked how far it was to the farm. Oh, we're not going to the farm now. The Colonel's spending the night at the Folly. Crazy place, but it's coming in very useful. After a few moments, Pongo saw a great stone wall. There you are, said the cat. Your puppies are behind that. She led them from the road over the rough grass of the heath to some rusty iron gates where they peered through the bars. Beyond a stretch of grass was a pond, and beyond that a large house painted black. Somehow it looked like a face with a menacing expression, its windows staring at them frighteningly. That's Hell Hall for you, said the cat. She then led them round the walls, which completely encircled the house, until they came to a tower rising high above the treetops. It was built of rough grey stone, like the wall, and was rather like a church tower. But there was no church. The tower simply jutted out of the wall. Well, may they call it a folly, said the cat. Mrs. did not know what the word meant, but Pongo had seen a folly before and was able to explain. The name is often given to expensive, odd buildings built for no sensible reason. The cat meowed three times, and there were three answering barks from inside the tower. A moment later came the sound of a bolt being drawn back. The colonel's the only dog I ever knew who could manage bolts with his teeth, said the cat proudly. Pongo instantly decided he would learn to manage bolts. Come in, come in, said a rumbling voice, but let me have a look at you first. There's not much light inside yet. An enormous sheepdog came out. Pongo saw at once that this was none of your dapper military men, but a lumbering old soldier man, possibly a slow thinker, but widely experienced. 
His eyes glittered shrewdly and kindly through his masses of grey and white woolly hair. Mm, glad to see your large Dalmatians, he said approvingly. I've nothing against small dogs, but the size of all breeds should be kept up. Well, now, what's been happening to you? There was a rare to do on the twilight barking last night when no one had any news of you. He led the way into the folly, while Pongo told of their day with the spaniel. Sounds a splendid fellow, said the colonel. Sorry he's not on the barking. Now, tuck in, you two. I provided breakfast just in case you turned up. There was plenty of good farmhouse food and a deep round tin full of water. The cat acted as hostess during the meal. When they had finished, the colonel said, mm, And now we'll show our guests their sleeping quarters. The cat shot a quick look at the colonel and said, I've told them the pups won't be out for hours yet. Ah, oh, said the colonel, yes, you must both have a good rest before you start worrying. Worrying, said Pongo sharply, is something wrong? I give you my word, there is nothing wrong with your puppies, said the colonel. Pongo and Mrs. believed him, and yet they both thought there was something odd about his voice and about the look the cat had given him. Now, up we go, the colonel went on briskly. You're sleeping on the top floor because that's the only floor where the windows aren't broken. Want a ride, Lieutenant Tibb? Cat. The cat jumped on the colonel's back and held on to his long hair. Pongo had never before seen a cat jump onto a dog's back with friendly intentions. The narrow, twisting stairs went up through five floors of the folly, most of them full of broken furniture, old trunks and all manner of rubbish. On the top floor was a deep bed of straw, brought up by the colonel in a sack. But what interested Mrs. far more was the narrow window. Surely it must look towards Hell Hall. She ran to see. Yes, beyond the treetops and a neglected orchard was the back of the black house. At one side was a large stable yard. Is that where the puppies will come out? she asked. Yes, yes, said the colonel, but it won't be for, well, some time yet. I shall never sleep until I've seen them, said Mrs. Yes, you will, because I shall talk you to sleep, said the colonel. Your husband has asked me to tell him the history of Hell Hall. Now come and lie down. Then he sent the cat to start collecting food for the next meal and began to talk in his rumbling voice. This was the story he told. Hell Hall had once been an ordinary farmhouse named Hill Hall. The farmer, whose name was Hill, got into debt and sold Hill Hall to an ancestor of Cruella de Vil's, who liked its lonely position on the wild heath. He intended to pull the farmhouse down and build himself a fantastic house, which was to be a mixture of a castle and a cathedral, and had begun by building the surrounding wall and the folly. Once the wall, with its heavy iron gates, was finished, strange rumours began to spread. Villagers crossing the heath at night heard screams and wild laughter. Were there prisoners behind the prison-like wall? People began to count their children carefully. Mrs. had taken in very little of this and was now fast asleep, but Pongo was keenly interested. By this time, the colonel went on, people were calling the place Hell Hall and the Deville chap plain devil. The end came when the men from several villages arrived one night with lighted torches prepared to break open the gates and burn the farmhouse down. But as they approached the gates, a terrific thunderstorm began and put the torches out. Then the gates burst open, seemingly of their own accord, and out came Deville driving a coach and four. And the story is that lightning was coming not from the skies, but from Deville. Blue forked lightning. All the men ran away screaming, never came back, and neither did Deville. The house stood empty for thirty years. Then someone rented it. It's been rented again and again, but no one ever stays. And it still belongs to the Deville family? asked Pongo. There's only Cruella Deville left of the family now. Yes, she owns it. She came down here some years ago and had the house painted black. It's red inside, I'm told. But she never lived here. She lets the Badden brothers have it rent free as caretakers. <laughs> I wouldn't let them take care of any kennel of mine. Those were the last words Pongo heard, for as the story ended, sleep wrapped him round. The sheepdog stood looking down at the peaceful couple. Well, they're in for a shock, he thought, and then lumbered his way downstairs. 
It was less than an hour later when Mrs. opened her eyes. She had been dreaming of the puppies. She had heard them barking. And they were barking. She sprang out of the straw and dashed to the window. No pup was to be seen, but you could hear the barking clearly. It was coming from inside the black house. Then the barking grew louder, the door to the stable yard opened, and out came a stream of puppies. Mrs. blinked. Surely her puppies could not have grown so much in less than a week. And surely she had not had so many puppies. More and more were hurrying out. The whole yard was filling up with fine, large, healthy Dalmatian puppies. But Mrs. raised her head in a wail of despair. These puppies were not hers at all. The whole thing was a mistake. Her puppies were still lost, perhaps starving, perhaps even dead. Again and again she howled in anguish. Her first howl had wakened Pongo. He was beside her in a couple of seconds and staring at the yard full of milling, tumbling puppies. And they were still coming out of the house, rather smaller puppies now. And then they saw him, smaller even than they had remembered. Lucky! There was no mistaking that horseshoe of spots on his back. And after him came Roly-Poly, falling over his feet as usual. Then Patch and the tiny cad pig and all the others. All well, all lashing their tails, all eager to drink at the low troughs of water that stood about in the yard. Look, Patch is helping the cad pig to find a place, said Mrs. delightedly. But what does it mean? Where have all these other puppies come from? Dazed as he was with sleep, Pongo's keen brain had gone into instant action. He saw it all. Cruella must have begun stealing puppies months before, soon after that evening when she had said she would like a Dalmatian fur coat. The largest pups in the yard looked at least five months old. Then they went down and down in size. Smallest and youngest of all were his own puppies, which must obviously have been the last to be stolen. He had barely finished explaining this to Mrs. when the sheepdog reached the top of the stairs. He'd been downstairs getting in fresh water and had heard Mrs. Howell. Well, now you know, he said. I was hoping you could have had a good sleep first. But why are you both looking so worried? asked Mrs. Our puppies are safe and well. Yes, my dear, you go on watching them, said Pongo gently. Then he turned to the colonel. You come downstairs and have a drink, my boy, said the colonel. Oh, how Pongo needed that drink. He drained the tin. I'll get more, said the colonel, gripping the handle of the small tin bucket between his teeth. I borrowed this for my little pet, Tommy. This is the only way I know that a dog can carry water. They went out into the early morning sunlight and to a nearby stream, where the colonel carefully lowered the bucket and pulled it up full. Back in the folly, Pongo said, Colonel, how many puppies are there? Can't tell exactly because they never keep still, but I'd say, counting yours, getting on for a hundred. A hundred? Colonel, what am I going to do? Will your lady wife want just to rescue her own puppies? She may at first, said Pongo, but not when she realises it would mean leaving all the others to certain death. If the worst came to the worst, would your pets give them a home? Pongo couldn't imagine the dearlies refusing to help any dog. But getting on for a hundred? Still, the drawing room was very large. I don't believe they'd turn them away, he said. But, Colonel, I could never get the whole lot of them to London. Not as they are, of course. Every dog jack of them has to be trained. They must learn to march, to obey orders. Something was puzzling, Pongo. Colonel, why did Cruella steal so many Dalmatians? She can't want more than one Dalmatian fur coat. The sheepdog looked astonished. Surely you know her husband's a furrier. I understand she only married him for his furs. So that was it. Pongo had forgotten. But if the DeVilles planned to sell Dalmatian coats to the public, then Hell Hall would be nothing less than a Dalmatian fur farm, and no Dalmatian would ever be safe again unless Cruella's career came to an end. I must cope with that when I get back to London, thought Pongo grimly as he mounted the stairs. He found Mrs. stretched out on the bare boards by the window. She had watched until the puppies had all gone in, then toppled into sleep. He pulled straw around her and lay down very close to keep her warm. She did not stir. His last waking thoughts were humble ones. He had expected the sheepdog to be some doddering old country gaffer. 
how much now depended on this shrewd, kind old soldier. It was dark when the colonel woke them. They went down and had an excellent meal of sausages which the cat had collected during the day. She was away at the farm. The colonel said there would be hurt feelings if she did not join her pets at tea to drink a saucer of milk. And I must go back later because my young pet, Tommy, likes me there while he has his bath. So let's be moving. He rose and pushed open a window. The defences of Hell Hall are childish, he said. What's the use of padlocked gates at the front when one can get in at the back through this folly? He drew back the bolt on the door into the folly, pushed the door open and rolled a heavy stone against it. Now, if you should want to get out in a hurry, but I don't think you will. Shouldn't wonder if you couldn't spend the night with your pups. Mrs. gasped with delight and began to ask questions. I'll explain as we go, said the Colonel, starting towards Hell Hall. A full moon was rising above the black house. Colonel, what's that on the roof? asked Pongo. Surely it isn't television, here? Oh, yes, it is, said the Colonel. And there's scarcely a cottage in the village hasn't got it since the electricity came. He then outlined his plans, and it soon appeared that television played an important part in them. The Baden brothers were so fond of it that they could not bear any puppy to bark while it was on, and unless the puppies were warm, they barked like mad. The warmest room in the house was the kitchen, which was where the television set was, so that was where the pups now lived, unless they were taking exercise in the stable yard. All this the Colonel had heard from Lucky during long, barked conversations. The plan was that Lucky should bring his brothers and sisters out to the stable yard while the Baddens were watching television. But it'll be too cold for them to stay out long, said the Colonel, and I don't see why you shouldn't go back into the kitchen with them. Lucky tells me there's no light except from the TV screen, so if you crouch down you should be quite safe. Even if the Baddens do see you, they'll just think you're two of the larger pups. But there's hardly any chance you will be seen, because Lucky tells me the Baddens stay glued to the TV until it ends, and then roll over and go to sleep. They've got mattresses on the kitchen floor. I see no reason why you shouldn't spend the night there. I'll call you at dawn, and you can get out before the Baddens wake. Pongo and Mrs. thought this was a wonderful idea. Can we sleep there every night? asked Mrs. The Colonel said he hoped so, and that it was at night that the pups would have to be drilled and trained for their march to London. Lucky says nothing wakes the Baddens, so I plan to come into the kitchen. I shall hold classes there and drill ten pups at a time in the stable yard, but you two must spend a quiet night there first and report conditions to me. By now they were almost at the stable yard. The Colonel opened the gate. Mrs. gave a soft moan and hurled herself across the yard. She had seen Lucky. There he stood, at the back door, waiting for them. And behind him, in the long, dark passage leading to the kitchen, were all his brothers and sisters. Who could describe what the mother and father felt during the next few minutes as they tried to cuddle fifteen wagging, wriggling, licking puppies all at once? Everyone tried to be quiet, but there were so many whimpers of bliss so much happy snuffling that the sheepdog got nervous. Will they hear in there? he asked Lucky. What, the barons? said Lucky rather indistinctly because he had got his mother's ear in his mouth. No, they've got their precious television on extra loud. Still, the colonel was relieved and the first joy of the meeting was over. Quiet now, said Pongo. Quiet as mice, said Mrs. But they were pleasantly surprised at how quiet the pups instantly were. The only sound came from some dead leaves stirred by fifteen lashing little tails. Now, still, said Lucky. All the tails stopped wagging. I'm teaching them to obey orders, said Lucky to the colonel. Good boy, good boy. Let's see, I made you a corporal this afternoon, didn't I? I now make you a sergeant. If all goes well, you shall have your commission next week. Now, I'm off to see my little pet Tommy have his bath. He told Pongo he would be back in a couple of hours. Slip out and tell me what you think of things, or send the sergeant with a message. As soon as he had gone, Lucky sent the other puppies to the kitchen, then took his father and mother in. You must stay at the back until your eyes get used to the dark, he said. And indeed it was dark. The only light came from the television screen and the kitchen fire, which were at opposite ends of the very large kitchen. 
and as the walls and ceiling were painted dark red, they reflected no light. It was extremely warm, much warmer than one fire could have made it. This was because there was central heating. Cruella de Vil had put it in when she planned to live in the house. At last Pongo and Mrs. found they could see fairly well, and it was a strange sight they saw. Only a few feet away from the television, two men lay sprawled on old mattresses, their eyes fixed on the screen. Behind them were ranged row after row of puppies, small pups at the front, large pups at the back. Those who did not care for television were asleep round the kitchen fire. Lucky whispered, I thought we could settle Mother with the family, and then I could show you round a bit. All the pups want to get a glimpse of you. Father, are you going to rescue them all? I hope so, said Pongo earnestly, wondering more and more how he was going to manage it. I told them you would, but they've been pretty nervous. I'll just send the word round that they can count on you. He whispered to a pup at the end of a row, and the word travelled like wind over a cornfield. There was barely a sound that a human ear could have heard, except a couple of tail thumps, instantly repressed. All knew they must not give away the fact that Pongo was in their midst, and when he went silently along the rows there was scarcely a movement, but he could feel great waves of love and trust rolling towards him. Blissfully happy, Mrs. sat with her children clustered about her. After Pongo had silently met all the pups, he told Lucky he would like to have a good look at the Baddens. So Lucky took him a little way up the back staircase, where they could see without being noticed. No one would have guessed that Saul and Jasper Badden were brothers. Saul was heavy and dark, with a forehead so low that his bushy eyebrows often got tangled with his matted hair. Jasper was thin and fair, with a chin so sharp and pointed that it had worn holes in all his shirts, not that he had many. Both brothers looked very dirty. Have they ill-treated any of you, he asked. No, they're too frightened of being bitten, said Lucky. They're terrible cowards. Some of the big pups did think of attacking them, but there seemed no way of getting out. And if they'd killed the Baddens, there would have been no one to feed us. Oh, father, how glad I am you've come. Pongo licked his son's ear. Pups, like boys, do not like fathers to be too sentimental. Mothers are different, but this was a very private moment. Then they went and sat with Mrs. and the family. It seemed strange that they could all be so peaceful right in the enemy's camp. Gradually the Pongo's puppies fell asleep, all except Lucky, Patch and the Cad Pig. Lucky was not sleepy. Patch was, but stayed awake because the Cad Pig was awake. And the Cad Pig stayed awake because she was crazy about television. Suddenly there was a thunder of thumps at the front door. The sleeping pups awoke in alarm. The Baden brothers lumbered to their feet and stumbled towards the door. But before they got there, it had been flung open. Outside, against the moonlit sky, stood a figure in a long white cloak. It was Cruella de Vil. For a few seconds, she stared into the dimly lit room. Then she shouted, Saul, Jasper, turn off that television and turn on the light. We can't turn on the light because we've got no electric bulbs left, said Saul Badden. When the telly finishes, we go to bed. And if we turn the telly off, there'll be no light at all, said Jasper Badden. We'll turn the sound off anyway, said Cruella angrily. I've got a job for you, my lads, she said to the Baddens. The pups must be killed tonight, every single one of them. The Baddens gaped at her. But they're not big enough yet to be made into fur coats, said Saul. The largest ones are, and the little ones can be made into gloves. Anyway, they've got to die before someone finds them. There's been so much in the papers about the dearless dogs, all England's on the hunt for Dalmatians. But how could anyone find them here, said Jasper Baden. Why can't they just stay on, growing bigger and bigger? It's too risky, said Cruella. Someone might hear them yapping and tell the police. My husband's going to ship the skins abroad, except the ones I keep for my own coat. I shall have it reversible. Persian lamb one side and Dalmatian dog the other. And wear the dog inside until people forget about the dearly's pups. When that happens, I'll collect another lot and we'll start our Dalmatian fur farm again. But this lot must be got rid of quickly. 
Oh, said the Baddens, both together. Listen, said Cruella de Vil. I don't care how you kill the little beasts. Hang them, suffocate them, drop them off the roof. Good gracious, there are dozens of lovely ways. I only wish I had time to do the job myself. Couldn't you make time, Mrs. de Vil, said Jasper. You'd do it so beautifully, it'd be a pleasure to watch you. Cruella shook her head. I've got to get back to London. Then a fiendish look came into her eyes. Here's an idea for you. Shut them up without food and then they'll kill each other. But they'd make a horrible noise about it, said Saul Baden. We'd never be able to hear the telly. Yes, and they'd damage each other's skins, said Cruella. That would ruin their value. You must kill them carefully. Then you can start the skinning. But we can't skin them, wailed Jasper. We don't know how. My husband will show you, said Cruella. We'll both drive down tomorrow night, and we shall count the bodies. Just remember that, will you? If you've let even one pup escape, I'll turn you out of Hell Hall. With that, she flung open the door, and the moonlight shone on her black and white hair and her absolutely simple white mink cloak. Then she looked back at the room full of puppies. Goodbye, you horrid little beasts, she said. I should like you so much better when you're skins instead of pups, and I shall simply love the ones who are made into my own coat. How I'm looking forward to it. They saw her walk out past the pond, which reflected the black house, and on to the great iron gates, which she unlocked and locked again behind her. Then, through the silent winter night, came the sound of a powerful car driving away, followed by one strident blast from the loudest motor horn in England. Pongo felt stunned. If only he could think. If only the sheepdog were there to advise him. Mrs. whispered, If you wish to attack those villains, I will help you, Pongo. The Baddens were talking together in low grunts. One thing's certain, said Jasper. We can't do it tonight or we shall miss what's my crime. It was their very favourite television programme. Two ladies and two gentlemen, in faultless evening dress, had to guess the crime committed by a lady or gentleman in equally faultless evening dress. Stern moralists said this programme was causing a crime wave and filling the prisons because people committed crimes in the hope of being chosen as contestants. We could kill the pups after what's my crime, said Saul. We ought to do it tonight while they're sleepy. They'll be more dangerous when they're wide awake. Ninety-seven pups, said Jasper. Then a wild gleam came into his eyes. Saul, I bet no one else has ever murdered ninety-seven Dalmatians. It might do the trick for us. It might get us onto what's my crime. Now you're talking, said Saul Baden. You and me in evening dress with coronations in our buttonholes and all England watching us. But we must think out some really striking way of doing our crime. Could we skin them alive? They'd never keep still, said Jasper. What about boiling them? Pongo whispered to Mrs. We shall have to attack. It's our only hope. I'll get the biggest pups to help you, said Ducky quietly. We'll all help. I can bite quite well. And then something happened. The cad pig, whose eyes were fixed on the silent television screen, gave three short, sharp barks. No human ear would have known that those barks meant, what's my crime? But the Baden brothers, startled by the noise, looked towards the cad pig and, in doing so, noticed the television screen. Saul Baden let out a roar of rage. Jasper Baden gave a howl of misery. It was on. What's my crime? but without any sound, of course. They were missing it, their favourite of all programmes, and just when, for the first time, they had hopes of appearing on it. They hurled themselves at the television set. Saul turned the sound on full blast. Jasper adjusted the picture. Then they flung themselves down on their mattresses, grunting with delight. They won't stir for the next half hour, whispered Lucky. At last, Pongo's brain sprang into full action. Instantly, he whispered to Lucky, March the pups out to the stable yard. Your mother and I will mount guard over the baddens. Lucky whispered, If we could go out through the larder, we could eat tomorrow's breakfast on our way. That's the door by the fireplace. 
It's bolted, but I expect you can unbolt it, can't you, father? Pongo had never even tried to unbolt a door, but he'd seen the sheepdog do it. Yes, Lucky, he said firmly, I can unbolt it. A cold draught came from the larder. It had been the dairy when Hell Hall was a farm, and there were wooden slats instead of windows. The moonlight, shining in through the slats, made bright stripes on the stone floor. Meat for the puppies' breakfasts was already set out in long troughs, because the Baddens hated working in the early morning. There were small troughs for the little pups, and big ones for the larger pups. Pongo said to Lucky, Wait until I get back to your mother. Then, while she and I stand ready to attack the Baddens, march all the pups in here. Tell them no pup is to eat until the last pup has a place at the trough. I will join you then and give the word to start eating. It was remarkable how quickly the pups left the kitchen under Sergeant Lucky's whispered directions. Pongo and Mrs. watched the Baddens anxiously, for the hundreds of little toenails made a clitter-clatter on the kitchen floor, and there were a few scuffles, snuffles and snorts though never even the smallest bark, for the pups guessed their lives depended on their silence. But the Baddens had eyes and ears for nothing but television. Lucky left his own brothers and sisters to the last. Then Pongo and Mrs. sped swiftly and silently across the big red kitchen. They looked back from the larder door and saw that the Baddens had not stirred. How much longer will What's My Crime last? whispered Pongo. Twenty minutes said the cad pig, promptly and wistfully. Pongo and Mrs. closed the larder door. The bolt on the inside was low down and easy to manage. Pongo shot it home at once, while the pups looked on admiringly. Every pup had its place at a trough, but not one lick of food had been eaten. One, two, three, feed, commanded Pongo. In 59 seconds flat, every scrap of food had been eaten. But what about you and mother, said Lucky. I think I can find the bad and Sunday dinner. He found it on a shelf. Two steaks, rather poor grade, but Pongo and Mrs. swiftly ate them. Pongo now felt he must get his troops out of Hell Hall as fast as possible. There'd be no time to think out plans for the future. He was counting on the colonel's advice. All that could be done now was to lead the pups to the folly. The outer door of the larder was easily opened. Then across the old orchard they went, and through the folly doors which the colonel had so thoughtfully propped open. As Pongo marched everyone out, the sheepdog arrived. At first he thought Pongo had recklessly begun the escape too soon, but when he heard the true facts he praised Pongo highly, and was particularly pleased that all pups had been fed before escaping. That was Sergeant Lucky's idea, said Pongo proudly. Good work, Sergeant Major, said the colonel. But where are we to go? asked Mrs. anxiously. Look, the puppies are shivering. They were, indeed, for though it was not freezing, it seemed terribly cold to them all after the warm kitchen. The sheepdog looked worried. What was he to do at a moment's notice with 97 Dalmatian puppies and two full-grown Dalmatians? At last he said, Our big barn for the night, anyway. Pups can keep warm in the straw. It's only half a mile across the heath. The big pups ran along happily. The medium-sized pups did quite well. Even most of the smaller pups looked as if they were capable of a reasonably long walk. But the smallest pups of all, Pongo's own family, how were they to walk over 70 miles? Lucky, Patch, Roly-Poly and the other boys struggled along bravely, but the girls stumbled and panted and had to have many rests. As for the cad pig, she would never have reached the farm at all if the sheepdog had not given her a lift. He lay down, and she climbed onto his back and held onto his long hair with her teeth. Even so, she nearly slipped off twice. She could never stay on our smooth backs, said Mrs. De Pongo. If only I could wheel her in a doll's perambulator. You couldn't walk to London on your hind legs, said Pongo, even if we had a perambulator. At last they reached the big barn at the back of the farm where the colonel lived. The tired pups snuggled into the hay and straw and instantly fell asleep. Pongo, Mrs. and the Colonel stood at the door, trying to make plans. The Colonel said, I can't keep you here long. You'd be found. Besides, I couldn't feed so many. We must get you to London by easy stages, just a few miles a day. But where shall we sleep? Where shall we find food? said Pongo anxiously. 
It will need tremendous organisation, said the Colonel. I hope to arrange the first stage at once by midnight barking. I must bark some distance from the farm or I shall wake my pets. But my smallest daughter is so weak, said Mrs. How can she make any journey? The Colonel smiled, not that anyone could see that. I have a plan for the little lass, he said. Now, sleep, sleep, both of you. So Pongo and Mrs. went into the dark barn and sniffed out their own family. Only Lucky stirred. He said he was trying to sleep with one eye open so as to be on guard. You close both eyes, said Mrs. firmly. And Lucky did, quite happy now that his parents were there to take charge. Pongo was dreaming he was back in Regent's Park, running after a stick thrown by Mr. Dearly, when a light tap on his shoulder woke him. It was Pussy Willow. The Colonel's compliments, and would you and your lady please come to him? All's well, said the cat soothingly. Food and shelter are arranged for two days ahead. Reception for the midnight barking was excellent. Please follow me now. It was still quite dark as they left the barn and crossed the farmyard. The cat led them to the back door of a large white farmhouse. Help me to push the door, she said. The colonel has unbolted it. The door opened easily. They went through a kitchen and along a passage, at the end of which was an open door and a glimmer of light. The cat led them through the doorway, and they found themselves in a nursery lit by a nightlight. At the far end, the sheepdog stood beside a little painted bed, in which was a very wide-awake two-year-old boy. <clears throat> this is my pet, Tommy, said the colonel. He very much wants to meet you. Pongo and Mrs. went to the little boy, and he patted them both. Then he made some odd chuckling noises. They did not sound like human, nor did they sound like dog, but the sheepdog seemed to understand them, and Tommy seemed to understand what the sheepdog answered. Pongo decided this was quite a new language, half dog, half human. Uh, Tommy wishes to lend you something, said the Colonel. He knows how much you need it and is most anxious to help you. See, here it is. Pongo and Mrs. then saw a little wooden cart, painted blue. It was made like a real farm cart, with four high wheels and a wooden railing all round it to keep the hay in. It was full of hay now. At the front was a long piece of wood with a wide crossbar at the end of it, so that Tommy could drag the cart about. You can choose two pups exactly the right size, said the Colonel, and they can take the crossbar in their mouths and then pull the cart forward, and if needed, pups at the back can push with their noses. Your smallest daughter can travel comfortably in the hay, and any puppy who is tired can sit beside her and take a rest. Pongo and Mrs. examined the pretty cart delightedly. They were too big to get between it and the crossbar themselves, but they felt sure plenty of the bigger pups would fit. But does he really want us to take it? asked Mrs. The sheepdog then spoke to Tommy, who nodded his head again and again while talking his extraordinary language. His name and address are painted on the side, said the sheepdog, and he would be glad if it can be returned one day, but uh, if that isn't possible, he will quite understand. If we ever get home, I feel sure Mr. Dearly will return it, said Pongo. Please tell Tommy how very grateful we are. The sheepdog translated this to Tommy, who smiled more than ever and made more chuckling noises. He says he is pleased you are pleased and would like to see all the puppies. I think it would be safe to march them all past his window when you leave, which should be soon now. So they said goodbye to Tommy, and then the sheepdog, going backwards, pulled the cart along the passage and out through the back door. He had quite a job. It's lucky my little pet sleeps on the ground floor, he said. It's because our stairs are so steep. I could never have got this cart down them. They went back to the barn and woke the pups and all the bigger ones came outside and tried the cart on for size. The cat pig was enchanted and settled down in the hay so that pups could practice pulling. While this was happening, Pongo was told the plans made by midnight barking. Only five miles was to be travelled before dawn, which would not be for over three hours, to a village where a friend of the colonel's lived at a bakery. And next door is a butcher's, so food will be all right, said the colonel. Then you'll do another five miles as soon as it's dark tomorrow, but my friend will tell you all about that. I hope to get you to London in ten or twelve days, billeting you where you can be safely hidden and fed. 
The last stages of the march will be the most difficult, but there are warehouses if we can get in touch with their watchdogs. There's a great Dane somewhere near Hampstead working on that already. Fine fellow, I hear he's a brigadier general. Ten days or even longer, Mrs. felt her heart sink. Pongo, she said suddenly, when is Christmas Day? The day after tomorrow, said the colonel. No, bless me, it's tomorrow, because it's Christmas Eve already, even if it isn't light yet. Don't worry, Mrs. Pongo, you shall have some Christmas dinner. But it was not food Mrs. was thinking about, but the dearlies, all alone for Christmas. Sometimes she forgot about them for an hour or two, but never for very long. She thought now of that last evening when she had rested her head on Mrs. Dearley's knee, trying to make her understand, and of the warm, white drawing-room, where there was to have been a Christmas tree with presents for the three dogs and the fifteen pups. Mrs. had heard the Dearleys planning it. Pongo guessed his wife's thoughts, which was easy to do because his own were much the same. Never mind, Mrs., he said. We'll be home by next Christmas. Then off you go, said the Colonel. But first, our cows have asked you in to have a drink with them. He led Pongo, Mrs., and all the pups into the dim cowshed, where the hay still smelt of summer weather. The head cows, Blossom and Clover, were waiting to welcome them and tell them how to drink at the milk bar. The pups found this easy, especially those who could remember being fed by their mothers, though the smaller pups had to stand on their hind legs and be supported by other pups. The long, warm drink of milk made a splendid breakfast. At last, after all their kind hostesses had been thanked, it was time to start. Tommy stood at his window, peering into the moonlight, watching the march past. Pongo and Mrs. wrinkled their nose at him in their best smile. Every pup turned his head, except the cad pig, who lay on her back in the hay-filled cart and waved all her four paws. The colonel, with a cat riding on his back, took them to the crossroads to see them off. But first he said that Sergeant Major Lucky could now be a lieutenant, and added, after a modest little cough, Um, I've just made myself a brigadier general. Then the Dalmatian army went swinging along the road in fine style. Though cold, the night was very still. The pups were rested and hopeful, and the fact that a tired little dog could take a rest with the cad pig in her cart made tired little dogs feel less tired. Indeed, Mrs. at first had to insist on the smaller pups taking turns to rest, but progress was not really fast. There were so many pauses while the pups who pulled the cart were changed, pauses while pups got in and out of the cart, and every half mile the whole army had a rest. At last, just before morning, they reached the village where they were to sleep. The sheepdog's friend, a handsome collie, was waiting to welcome them. No talk until you're safely hidden, he said. It's almost light. Quickly, they followed him across the village green to three old gabled houses. The baker's was in the middle, between the butcher's and the chimney sweeps. The baker and the butcher and the sweep were all widowers, and as it was Sunday, had already gone to spend Christmas with their married daughters, which was just as well. The baker's shop would not have been nearly big enough to house all the pups, but luckily there was a large bakehouse at the back and soon every pup was safely in and enjoying a splendid sausage roll. Pongo and Mrs. chatted to the collie while they ate. He shook his head worriedly. The trouble is that Dalmatians are such noticeable dogs. Ninety-nine of you together are spectacular, uh, though I mean it as a compliment. You'd be so much safer if you were black. Like that nice little pup over there, said Mrs. What pup? The collie looked across the bakehouse, then said sharply, That pup doesn't belong in this village. Who are you, my lad? Where have you come from? The black pup did not answer. Instead, he came running to Mrs. and butted her in the stomach. Here, hold hard, young man, said Mrs. Then she gasped. Goodness, it is, it isn't. It is roly-poly. The fat puppy, who was always getting into mischief, had found his way into a shed at the back of the sweep's house and had a fight with a bag of soot. Mercy, you'll need some washing, said his mother. Then it was that one of the keenest brains in dogdom had one of its brainiest waves. Roly-poly, said Pongo. Was there a lot of soot at the sweeps? Bags and bags, said Roly-poly. Then we are all going to be black dogs, said Pongo. 
Your husband is a genius, said the collie to Mrs. as he showed them all into the sweep's shed. There was any amount of soot, waiting to have done with it whatever sweeps do do with soot. Ten dogs forward at a time, commanded Pongo. Pups roll, pups rub noses. In a very short time, there were ninety-seven pitch-black pups. And uh, now, my love, said Pongo to Mrs., let us take a roll in the soot. Frankly, Mrs. did not fancy it. She hated soiling her gleaming white hair and losing its smart contrast with her beautiful black spots. But when Pongo had helped her with the final touches, he said, Why, Mrs., as a black dog, you're slimmer than ever. You're positively svelte. And then she felt much better. Then Pongo said, How does soot suit me? Soot suits you beautifully, said Mrs., and all the pups roared with laughter at her mistake. Then they all went back into the bakehouse and settled down to sleep. The collie said he would call them as soon as it was dark. They would only have five miles to go, to another bakery, but he felt they should get the journey over early as he had heard there might be snow. But there may be cars on the road until late, as it is Christmas Eve, and Sunday, he told them, so you must go by the fields. I shall escort you. Rest well now. Poor Mrs. When she awoke in the late afternoon and looked around her, she dissolved into sooty tears. I can't tell one pup from the other now they're black, she moaned. But she soon found she could, though she could never have explained how she managed it. Another meal had been organised, but it was not all that could have been wished because the butcher had meanly locked up his shop. This clears the bakery out, said the collie, carrying in the last stale loaf, but there will be a good supper waiting for you, and the journey oughtn't to take more than three or four hours. He then went off to see if there was any news coming in by the twilight barking. After half an hour or so, Pongo began to feel anxious. It was quite dark now. They ought to be off. What was delaying the collie? Listen, said Mrs. suddenly. Very, very faintly, they could hear the collie barking. He was calling Pongo's name again and again. Pongo and Mrs. ran out of the bakehouse to the little yard at the back. Now they could hear the collie more clearly, but he was obviously some way off. Pongo barked in answer to him. Then swiftly the collie told them what had happened. He was locked in a house across the green with no hope of getting out. The postmistress had promised to look after him while the baker was away for Christmas. She had decided it was too cold a night for a dog to be out, hauled him in and gone out for the evening. He had tried every door and every window, but could undo none of them. It was impossible for him to escort the Dalmatians as he had promised. But you can't miss your way, Pongo, he barked, out over the field at the back of the bakehouse and straight on for five miles. Pongo told him not to worry, but the poor collie was most unhappy. Here I am, locked up with a warm fire and a good supper and powerless to help you. Both Pongo and Mrs. told him to eat the supper and enjoy the fire and thanked him for all he had done. And now, off we go, said Pongo, bringing the pups out of the bakehouse. And no straggling, because it would be very easy to lose a black pup on a dark night. But it was not really a very dark night, for already the moon was rising and the stars were out. There was one specially large, bright star. The collie said, straight ahead, and that star is straight ahead, said Pongo, so we'll steer by it. Their way lay through grassy meadows, over which the cad pig's cart trundled smoothly. At every hedge and ditch, Pongo paused and counted the pups to see none had strayed, and Mrs. changed the pups who drew the cart and the pups who rested in it. Already even the smallest puppies were getting hardier. Even the cad pig got out of the cart and walked three fields before getting in again. Soon we shall be able to do ten miles a day, said Pongo. They had travelled about three miles when the first disaster of the night happened. There was a sudden bump and a wild squeal from the cad pig. A wheel had come off the little blue cart. Pongo saw at once that the cart could be mended. A wooden peg which fixed the hub of the wheel to the axle had come out. But could he ever, using his teeth, put this peg back? He tried and failed. Could the cat pig manage without the cart? He whispered to Mrs. Mrs. shook her head. Then mend the cart I must, said Pongo, and you must help me by holding the wheel in position. They tried and tried without success. Then while they were resting for a moment, 
Mrs. noticed that many of the pups were shivering. Couldn't they all go to that barn over there, she said. They could just see a big tiled roof two short fields away. Not very clearly, because the moon was behind clouds. It was this lack of light which made it so hard to mend the cart. That's a good idea, said Pongo, and when the cart's mended we can bring it along and call for them all. They kept two strong pups who did not mind the cold to draw the cart when mended. So ninety-five pups, led by Lieutenant Lucky, set off briskly for the barn. But when they got there, it did not look at all like the barn at the sheepdog's farm. It was built of grey stone and had long windows, some with coloured glass in them, and at one end was a tower. Cadpig and Patch managed to squeeze through a door that was not quite closed and wandered around, and suddenly made a discovery. Whatever this mysterious place was, it was certainly intended for puppies, for in front of every seat, and there were many seats, was a puppy-sized dog bed, padded and most comfortable. Why, it's just meant for us all to sleep in, said the cat pig. I'll tell the other pups, said Patch, starting for the door. A glad cry from the cat pig called him back. Look, look, television! But it was not like the television at Hell Hall. It was much larger, and the figures on the screen did not move or speak. Indeed, it was not a screen. The figures were really there, on a low platform, humans and animals, most lifelike, though smaller than in real life. They were in a stable, above which was one bright star. Look at the little humans kneeling, said Patch. No dogs, said the cat pig. What a pity, but I like it much better than ordinary television, only I don't know why. Then they heard Lucky and the others who had found their way in. Soon every pup was curled up on a comfortable dog bed and fast asleep, except the cat pig. She had dragged one of the dog beds by its most convenient little carpet ear and was sitting on it, wide awake, gazing and gazing at this new and far more beautiful television. Once the moon came out from behind the clouds, Pongo managed to mend the wheel. Oh, the feeling of satisfaction when the peg slipped into place. Mrs. Too felt proud. Had she not held the wheel? She, a dog who had never understood machinery. Quickly the two waiting pups seized the crossbar in their mouths. Then off they all went to the barn. But as they drew nearer, Pongo saw that this was no barn. Surely they can't have gone in there, he said to Mrs. Why not if they were cold, said Mrs. And they're far too young to know they would not be welcome. Pongo and Mrs. both knew that humans did not like dogs to go into buildings which had towers and tall, narrow windows. They had no idea why, and had at first been a little hurt when told firmly to wait outside. But Mrs. Deary had once said, We would love you to come in if it were allowed, and I would go in far oftener if you could. So it was obviously one of those mysterious things, such as no one, not even humans, ever being allowed to walk on certain parts of the grass in Regent's Park. We must get them out quickly, said Pongo, and go on with our journey. They soon found the door in the tower, which the biggest pups had pushed wide open. Because Mrs. had always been left outside, she disliked these curious buildings with towers and high windows. But the minute she got inside, she changed her mind. This was a wonderful place, so peaceful and somehow so welcoming. But where are the pups, she said, peering all around. She saw lots of black patches on the moonlit floor, but had quite forgotten that all the pups were now black. Then she remembered, and as she drew nearer to the sleeping pups, tears sprang to her eyes. Look, look at all the puppy beds, she cried. What good people must live here. It can't be the kind of place I thought it was, said Pongo. An hour or so later, just before the evening service, the verger said to the vicar, I think there must be something wrong with the stove, sir. On every hassock, he had found a small, circular patch of soot. Last lap before supper, said Pongo, as they started off again across the moonlit fields. It was the most cheering thing he could have said, for the 97 puppies were now extremely hungry. He had guessed this because he was hungry himself, and so was Mrs., but she was feeling too peaceful to mind.
They went on for nearly two miles. Then Pongo saw a long row of cottage roofs ahead across the field. This should be it, he said. What is that glow in the sky beyond the rooftops? asked Mrs. Pongo was puzzled. He called a halt and barked news of their arrival. He was answered at once by a bark that said, Wait where you are, I'm coming. Soon a graceful red setter came dashing towards them. They guessed, even before she spoke, that something was very wrong. The bakery is on fire. There's nothing for you to eat and nowhere for you to sleep, moaned the poor red setter. She was hysterical. And the village street's full of people. She looked pitifully at Mrs. Oh, all your poor hungry puppies. The strange thing was that Mrs. felt quite calm. She tried to comfort the setter, saying they would go to some barn. But no arrangements are made, wailed the setter, and there's no spare food anywhere. All the village dogs brought what they could to the bakery. Just then came a shrill whistle. Oh, my pet is calling me, said the setter. He's the doctor here. There's no dog at the bakery, so I was chosen to arrange everything, because I took first prize in a dog show, and now I've failed you. You have not failed, said Mrs. No one could say the fire was an act of dog. Go back to your pet and don't worry. We shall simply go on to the next village. Really? said the setter, gasping again, but with relief. Mrs. kissed her on the nose. Off with you, my dear, and don't give the matter another thought, and thank you for all you did. The whistle came again, and the setter ran off, wildly waving her feathered tail. Feather-brained as well as feather-tailed, said Pongo. Just very young, said Mrs. gently. I doubt if she's had a family yet. Well, on to the next village. Thank you for being so brave, dear Mrs., said Pongo. But where is the next village? In the country there are villages in every direction, said Mrs. Brightly. Desperately worried though he was, Pongo smiled lovingly at her. Then he said, We will go to the road now. But what about traffic, Pongo? We shall not be very long on the road, said Pongo. We must go into the village and find the police station. Mrs. stared at him in horror. No, Pongo, no. The police will take the puppies from us. But they will feed them, Mrs. And perhaps we shall be kept together until Mr. Dearly has been told about us. They will have read the papers. They will know we are the missing Dalmatians. But we are not Dalmatians any more, Pongo, cried Mrs. We are black. They will think we are ordinary stray dogs. And we are illegal. Ninety-nine dogs without collars. We should be put in prison. Mrs. Dear Mrs., we must go to the police station, he said, and turned towards the village. They could now see the burning bakery, and at that moment a huge flame leapt up through the roof. By its light, Pongo saw the whole village street, with the villagers making a human chain to hand along buckets of water. And he also saw something else, something which made him stop dead, shouting, Halt! at the top of his bark. In front of the burning bakery was a great striped black and white car and with it was Cruella de Vil standing right up on the roof of the car where she had climbed so as to get a good view of the fire her white face and absolutely simple white mink cloak no longer looked white from head to foot she was bathed in the red gold flicker of the flames and as they leapt higher and higher she clapped her hands in delight their plight was now worse than ever they not only had to face the dangers of hunger and cold, there was the added danger of Cruella. They knew from the direction her car was facing that their enemy must have already been to Hell Hall, learned that they had escaped, and now be on her way back to London. At any moment, she might leave the fire and overtake them. If only they could have left the road and travelled by the fields again. But there were now woods on either side of the road, woods so thick that the army could not have kept together. But we can hide in there if we see the car's headlights, said Pongo, and explained this to the puppies. The army was on the march again. Then, from the village behind them, came the strident blare of the loudest motor horn in England. To the woods, cried Pongo. But he saw that the woods were now protected by wire netting, through which not even the smallest pup could squeeze, and there was no ditch to hide in. But he could see that the woods ended not very far ahead, we must go on, he cried. There may be fields, there may be a ditch. The horn sounded again, repeatedly. Pongo guessed that the fire engine had put out the fire, and now Cruella was scattering the villagers as she drove on her way. Already she would be less than two miles behind them, 
and the great striped car could travel two miles in less than two minutes. But the woods were ending, there were fields ahead. To the fields, cried Pongo. Faster, faster! The pups made a great spurt forward, then fell back in dismay. For though the woods ended, the wire netting still continued on both sides of them. There was still no way off the road. And the horn sounded again, louder and nearer. Nothing but a miracle can save us now, said Pongo. Then we must find a miracle, said Mrs. Firmly. Pongo, what is a miracle? It was at that very moment that they suddenly saw a very large van drawn up on the road ahead of them. The tailboard was down, and the inside of the van was lit by electric light. And sitting there, on a newspaper, was a Staffordshire Terrier, who looked up from the paper, which he was reading as well as sitting on, and stared in astonishment at the army of pups rushing helter-skelter towards him. Help, 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 barked Pongo. We are being pursued. How soon can we get off this road? Oh, I don't know, mate, barked back the Staffordshire. You'd better hide in my van. The miracle, the miracle, gasped Pongo to Mrs. Quickly, pups, jump into the nice miracle, said Mrs., who now thought miracle was another name for a removal van. A swarm of pups surged up the tailboard. Up went the cad pig's cart, pulled from the front and pushed from behind. Then more and more pups jumped or scrambled up until the entire army was in. Oh, golly, there are a lot of you, said the Staffordshire, who had flattened himself against the side of the van. Lucky the van was empty. Who's after you, mates? Old Nick? Uh, some relation of his, I think, said Pongo. The strident horn sounded again. And she's in that car. Then I'd better put the lights off, said the Staffordshire, neatly working the switch with his teeth. That's better. But the car's headlights will shine in, gasped Pongo. Our enemy will see the pups. Not black pups in a black van, said the Staffordshire. Not if I close her eyes. Oh, excellent suggestion. Quickly, Pongo gave the command. Pups, close your eyes, or else they will reflect the car's headlights and shine like jewels in the darkness. Close them and do not open them, however frightened you are, until I give the word. Remember, your lives may depend on your obedience now. Close your eyes and keep them closed. Instantly, all the puppies closed their eyes tight. And now the car's headlights were less than a quarter of a mile away. Close your eyes, missus, said Pongo. And don't forget to close your own, mate, said the Staffordshire. The noise of horn and engine grew deafening. The glare seemed blinding, even to closed eyes. Then, with a roar, the great striped car was on them. And past them, roaring on and on into the night. You may open your eyes now, my brave, obedient pups, cried Pongo. And indeed they deserved praise, for not one eye had been opened. That was quite a car, mate, said the Staffordshire to Pongo. You must have quite an enemy. Who are you, anyway? The local pack of soothounds. Then he suddenly stared very hard at Pongo's nose. Well, swap me if it isn't soot. And it doesn't fool me. You're the missing Dalmatians. Want a lift back to London? A lift? A lift all the way in this wonderful van. Pongo and Mrs. could hardly believe it. Swiftly, the pups settled to sleep on the rugs and blankets used for wrapping round furniture. But why are there so many pups, said the Staffordshire. The newspapers don't know the half of it, <laughs> nor the quarter neither. They think there are only 15 missing. Pongo started to explain, but the Staffordshire said they would talk during the drive to London. My pets will uh, be out of that house there any minute. Fancy us doing a removal on Sunday and Christmas Eve. But the van broke down yesterday and we had to finish the job. Now, shush. A large man in a rough apron was coming out of a nearby house. The Staffordshire, wagging his tail enthusiastically, hurled himself at the man's chest, nearly knocking him down. Oh, look out, Bill, said the man over his shoulder. The canine cannonballs feeling frisky. Bill was an even larger man but even he was shaken by the Staffordshire's loving welcome. Get down, you self-launched bomb, he shouted with great affection. The two men and the Staffordshire came back to the van, and the Staffordshire jumped inside. The sooty Dalmatians, huddled together, were invisible in the darkness. Want to ride inside, do you? said Bill. He put the tailboard up and shouted, Next stop, St John's Wood. A moment later, the huge van took the road. St John's Wood. 
Surely that was where the splendid vet lived, quite close to Regent's Park. What wonderful, wonderful luck, thought Pongo. Just then he heard a clock strike. It was still only eight o'clock. Mrs, he cried, we shall get home tonight. We shall be home for Christmas. Yes, Pongo, said Mrs gaily. But she did not feel as gay as she sounded. For Mrs, who had been so brave, so confident up to the moment they'd found the miracle, had been thinking. Suppose the dearlies did not recognise them now they were black dogs. Suppose the dear, dear dearlies turned them away. She kept her fears to herself. Why should she frighten Pongo with them? Meanwhile, Pongo had his own worries. He had been telling the Staffordshire all about Cruella and had remembered what she had said that night at Hell Hall, how she intended to wait until people had forgotten about the stolen puppies and then start her Dalmatian fur farm again. How could he make sure that other puppies did not end up as fur coats later on? The Staffordshire, like Mrs., wondered if the dearlies would recognise these black Dalmatians and if even the kindest pets would take in so many pups. But he said nothing of this to Pongo. Mrs., lulled by the movement of the van, had fallen asleep. Soon Pongo slept too, but their dreams were haunted by their separate anxieties. On and on through the dark went the mile-eating miracle. The Staffordshire woke them up in good time. Every pup must be ready to leap out of the van the minute the tailboard was down. Not that my dear pets would hurt you if they saw you, said the Staffordshire, but it might cause delay. The van will stop in a big, dark garage. Streak out, turn sharp left, and you'll be in a dimly lit muse, and on your way. We'll say goodbye now. Can we send you news on the twilight barking, asked Pongo. Oh, hardly ever get the chance to listen to it, said the Staffordshire. But I shall get news of you all right. I'm a great one for newspapers. They pass the time on the road. Always plenty of them in the van. We use them for packing. Well, here we are. The van stopped. The Staffordshire began to bark loudly. Cool, let him out, Jim, said Bill, before he breaks the sound barrier. Down came the tailboard. Out shot the Staffordshire. This time, he managed to knock Jim right down before turning to Bill, whom he tackled low. Just about winded me, he had, said Bill proudly. You flying saucer, you. Jim got to his feet and spoke lovingly to the Staffordshire. If England had six of you, we shouldn't need no army, he said. Come home and get your supper, you misguided missile. Bill and Jim had been much too occupied to notice the black dogs streaming out of the van and out of the dark garage into the mews. Snow had been falling for hours, so that London was all white. It took only a few minutes to reach Regent's Park. How beautiful it looked, snowy under the stars. They had not come back to the outer circle by the way they had left it, but were at the other side of the park, close to Cruella de Ville's house. As they drew near to it, Pongo saw that every window was dark, so he thought it would be safe to call a moment's halt. Look, pups, he told them, that is our enemy's house. Mrs. was looking down into the area. Something moved there. It was Cruella's Persian cat. Her back was arched and she was spitting angrily. Pongo said quickly, Madam, none of us would ever dream of hurting you. The white cat said, That's the civilest speech I ever had from a dog. Who are you? There are no black dogs round here. We are not usually black except for our spots, said Pongo. We once visited your house. He got no further because the white cat guessed everything. And you've rescued all the pups from Hell Hall. Well, bravo, bravo. I couldn't be more pleased. Then Mrs. said, I might have known you would sympathise, for I once heard you lost many kittens in early infancy. Forty-four to the present date, said the white cat, all drowned by the fiend I live with. Why don't you leave her, asked Pongo. I bide my time, said the white cat. I wait for my full revenge. I can't do much on my own, I've only two pairs of paws, but I scare servants away. Any cat can make a house seem haunted. I let the place become overrun with mice, and oh, how I scratch the furniture. Though it's heartbreaking how little she notices it, she's such a rotten housewife. Why not let your pups come in and do some damage now? Oh, please, please let us, clamoured all the pups. Pongo shook his head. Cruella will be back. I'm surprised she's not home already. Oh, she's been back, said the white cat, and gone out to dinner. 
She had to, because I scared another batch of servants away this morning as a little Christmas present for her. Do come in. No, no, Pongo, cried Mrs. This is no moment for revenge. We should get the pups home. They're hungry. Mrs., I now feel that we should do as our friend here suggests. It would take me a long time to explain why, so will you trust me, please? Of course, Pongo, said Mrs. loyally. And if you're sure we really ought to be revenged on Cruella, well, <laughs> naturally I shall enjoy it. Then follow me, said the white cat. There's a way in at the back. Lucky and two big, loud-barked pups were left on guard. They were sorry to miss the fun, but duty was duty. Three barks if you sight the striped car or hear its horn, Pongo told them. Then marched all the other pups after the white cat, who took them in through the coal cellar. Nothing down here worth wrecking, she said, making for the stairs. Up through the dark house they went, until she paused outside a bolted door. Now, if you really can undo that bolt, she said to Pongo, goodness knows I've tried often enough. Oh, he's splendid at bolts, said Mrs. proudly. It was a nice chromium bolt, well oiled. It gave Pongo no trouble at all. There was enough light from the lamps on the outer circle to show them a big room, in which were many racks of fur coats. Why, Cruella must own dozens of them, thought Mrs. And there were many fur stoles, muffs and tippets too. Pongo barked his orders. Four pups to a coat, two pups to a stole, one pup to a muff. Present teeth, tear. There was not enough space in one room to finish the whole job, so the pups spread themselves throughout the house. After that, the fur flew with a vengeance in every direction. Chinchilla, sable, mink and beaver, nutria, fox, kolinsky and many humbler skins. From kitchen to attic, the house was filled with a fog of fur. And the white cat did not forget the ermine sheets. She did good work on those herself, moving so fast that it was hard to see which was clawed white ermine and which was clawing white cat. I've been slack, she said. I could have got at these years ago. One needs company for a job like this, said Pongo. No more furs to tear now, said the cat pig sadly. She had just shredded a little sable tippet all by herself. Quiet, barked Pongo suddenly. Had his ears deceived him? No, there it was again a distant blast from the loudest motor horn in England. The next instant, the pups outside barked the alarm. Down, down to the coal cellar, barked Pongo. There was a wild scurry of pups down the dark stairs. The white cat sprang to a window. You'll have time, she cried. The car's only just turned into the outer circle. But Pongo knew how fast that car could come, and pups were falling over each other in the darkness. There were bumps and yelps. Roly-poly fell through the banisters. It was amazing that he was not hurt. But at last they were all streaming out of the coal cellar into the mews. We must make sure she's gone indoors before we march on, said Pongo, and he ran into the narrow passage that led to the outer circle. Mrs. ran after him. Cautiously, they peered out of the passage and saw the striped car stop in front of the Deville's house. Mr. Deville, who had been driving, helped Cruella out and then went up the front doorsteps. He started to search for his latchkey. Cruella stood waiting, with the cloak hanging loosely round her shoulders. I shan't sleep if she keeps that cloak, said Mrs. And you need your sleep, Mrs., said Pongo. The same idea had come to both of them. The cloak hung so loosely, so temptingly. She'll never recognise us now we're black, he said. Let's risk it. Now! They dashed towards Cruella and seized the hem of the cloak. It slipped from her shoulders quite easily and fell on top of Pongo and Mrs. Blindly they hurled themselves along the outer circle, with the cloak spread out over them and looking as if it was running by itself. Cruella screamed, It's bewitched! Go after it, quick! No fear, said Mr. Deville. I think an ancestor of yours is running away with it. You'd better come indoors. The next moment he and Cruella started to cough violently for as they opened the front door, they were met by a choking cloud of fur. Somehow Pongo and Mrs. found their way to the passage, where they came from under the cloak and dragged it to the mews. Here the pups fell on it, and that was the end of the absolutely simple white mink cloak. Lights were now flashing on all over the Deville's house, and Cruella could be heard shrieking with rage. 
This is where we march home quickly, said Pongo. There were lights in the drawing room window. Mr and Mrs Dearly haven't gone to bed yet, said Pongo. Lights were shining up from the kitchen. The nannies are still awake, said Mrs. She said it brightly. No one could have guessed how frightened she was, though her heart was thumping so hard she was afraid Pongo would hear it. Why should the Dearlies let a mob of strange black dogs into the house? Suppose they were all turned away, ninety-nine hungry Dalmatians, outcasts in the night. At that moment, snow began to fall again, very, very thickly. That evening, the Dearlies had invited the nannies to come up to the drawing room, and they all played nursery card games, Snap, Beggar My Neighbour, and Animal Grab. They all pretended to enjoy themselves, which was very hard work. At last, Mr Dearlie said he would put some Christmas carols on the gramophone. Now, carols are always beautiful, but if you are sad, they can make you feel sadder. Soon the Dearlies and the nannies could hardly keep the tears out of their eyes. When Mr. Dearly realised this, he thought, this must be the last carol we play. It was silent night. Mrs. Dearly put out the lights and drew back the curtains of the tall windows so that they could see the stars while they listened. And she saw it was snowing again. She went back to the sofa and stroked Perdita, who just gazed at the falling snowflakes. The voices singing Silent Night were high and clear and peaceful and not very loud. Suddenly, everyone in the room heard a dog bark. That's Pongo, cried Mr. Dearly, and dashed to a window. That's Mrs., cried Mrs. Dearly, hearing a different bark, as she, too, dashed to the window. They flung the window open wide and stared down through the swirling snow. Down below were two black dogs. Mrs. Dearly said gently, You shouldn't be out on a night like this. Go home to your owners, my dears. The dogs barked again, but Mr. Dearly said, Home, very firmly, for he felt sure the dogs lived somewhere near and had been let out for a last run before going to bed. He shut the window, saying to Mrs. Dearly, Odd-looking dogs, I can't recognise the breed. Pongo had a moment of panic. This was something he had not foreseen. But quickly he pulled himself together. We must bark again, he said, and much louder. So he barked again. And then Mrs. barked. They went on and on, taking it in turns. Up in the drawing room, Mrs. Dearly said, I can't believe that's not Pongo and Mrs. And look how excited Perdita is. It's because we're all so longing to hear them, said Mr. Dearly. We imagine we do. But there must be something wrong with those black dogs. Just listen to them. Perhaps they're lost. And again he opened the window. Pongo and Mrs. barked louder than ever and wagged their tails wildly. Anyone would think they knew us, said Mr. Dearly. I shall go down and see if they have collars on. Perhaps I can take them to their homes. Pongo heard this and said to Mrs. quickly, The moment the door opens, dash in and lead the way up to the drawing room. Pups, you follow Mrs., noses to tails. I will bring up the rear. And never let there be one moment when Mr. Dearly can close the front door. Once we are in, we can make them understand. The front door opened, and out came Mr. Dearly. In shot Mrs., closely followed by the Cadbig, now out of her cart, and all her brothers and sisters except Lucky, who insisted on waiting with Pongo. What with the darkness and the swirling snow, Mr. Dearly did not see what was happening until a pup bumped into him in passing. It was roly-poly, of course. Then he looked down to see what had bumped him, and saw a steady stream of black pups going through the front door and the white hall and up the white stairs. I'm dreaming this, thought Mr. Dearly, and pinched himself hard. But the stream of pups went on and on. Suddenly there was a hitch. The two pups, faithfully dragging the cad pig's little blue cart, now empty, could not get it up the steps. Mr. Dearly, who could never see a dog in difficulty without helping, at once picked the cart up himself. After seeing the cart, he no longer felt he was dreaming. These dogs are a troop from a circus, he thought. But why have they come to us? A moment later, Pongo and Lucky went past, and the stream of dogs stopped. Mr. Dearly called into the night, Um, any more out there? To his relief, no dog answered, so he went in and closed the door. Pongo's sooty hindquarters were just rounding the bend of the stairs. 
Mr. Dearly followed, four steps at a time, still carrying the little blue cart. The scene in the front drawing room was rather confused. Large as the room was, there was not floor space for all the puppies, so they were jumping onto tables and chairs and piling up on top of each other. There was rather a lot of noise. Mrs. Dearly was just managing to keep on her feet. She had never been frightened of any dog in her life, but she did feel a trifle startled. The nannies had taken refuge on top of the grand piano. Mr. Dearly took one look through the door, then dashed into the back drawing room and flung open the double doors. A sea of puppies surged in. And now that there was little spare floor space, Pongo barked a command. All pups who can find space, roll! Roll, missus! And he himself rolled the will. The Dearly stared in utter bewilderment. Then both of them shouted, Look! The white carpet was becoming blacker. The black dogs were becoming whiter. It's Pongo, cried Mr. Dearly. It's Mrs., cried Mrs. Dearly. It's Pongo, Mrs., and all their puppies, cried the nannies from the top of the piano. It's considerably more than all their puppies, said Mr. Dearly, just before Pongo forcibly embraced him. Mrs. was embracing Mrs. Dearly, and in a corner of the room there was a great deal more embracing. Perdita was going absolutely wild, trying to embrace eight puppies at once. They were her own long-lost family. It had never struck Pongo that they might be among the rescued pups. He had not even noticed their brown spots, because he had scarcely seen any of the pups by daylight before they all rolled in the soot. It turned out that Perdita's family was the one that fitted the cad pig's little blue cart so well and had pulled it so faithfully. Mr. Dearly had put the cart down in the back drawing room and the nannies had now got off the piano and gone to look at it. That's a child's toy, said Nanny Cook. And it's got a name and address on it, said Nanny Butler. And she read out, Master Tommy Tompkins, Farmer, Dimpling, Suffolk. Dimpling, said Mrs. Dearly. That's where Cruella de Vil has a country house. She told us about it when we had dinner with her and asked if we'd like to buy it. And then Mr. Dearly saw it all. He remembered Cruella's desire for a Dalmatian fur coat and guessed that she had collected all these pups so that Mr. Deville could make many such coats. You must have the law on her, cried both the nannies together. Mr. Dearly said he would think about that after Christmas, but now he must think about feeding the pups when all the shops were closed. He hurriedly telephoned the Ritz, the Savoy, Claridge's, and other rather good hotels, and asked them to send page boys along with stakes. The hotels were most anxious to help when they heard that the missing Dalmatians had come home. And at least six dozen more than I ever hoped for, said Mr. Dearly, not that he'd had time to count the pups. They can't sleep in their soot, said Nanny Cook firmly. Nanny Butler and I will work in our bathroom and you two can work in yours. And how about asking that splendid vet and his wife to pop round and bath pups in the laundry? By the time the last pup was washed, the stakes were arriving. There were enough for everyone, even the humans, who were by this time pretty hungry. Uh, they had theirs cooked. At last the splendid vet and his wife went home, and the house settled for the night. Pongo and Mrs. showed plainly that they wanted to sleep in their own baskets, with their puppies round them on the hearthrug and in armchairs. Perdita took her little lot into the laundry on a rather good satin eiderdown, the other pups slept all over the house on beds, sofas and chairs. The Dearlies and the Nannies managed to keep chairs for themselves, rather hard ones, but they did not mind because they didn't expect to sleep much. They wanted to be on hand in case any pup needed anything in the night. When all was quiet in the firelit kitchen and their fifteen pups were asleep, Pongo said to Mrs. Do you remember that night we left? How we looked back at this kitchen? Look now at your legal collar on its peg, ready for you to wear tomorrow, and your beautiful blue coat. Mrs. said, I'm so hardy now that I shall not need the coat, but I shall wear it from vanity. At that moment they heard a little noise at the window, a little scratching noise. Outside, in the midst of a white blur, were two green eyes. It was Cruella's white cat. Swiftly Pongo let her in. Such goings on at the Devilles, she said. Quickly Pongo turned to his wife. I haven't explained to you yet, missus. 
Our friend here told me that if we could get into that bolted room, we could destroy Mr. Deville's whole stock of furs. Cruella made him keep them all there so she could wear any she fancied. I hoped we might put an end to his furrier's business. That was why I took the risk of going into the Deville's house, not to be revenged, but to make England safe for Dalmatians. And it's even better than I hoped, said the white cat, because it turns out most of the furs weren't paid for, so Mr. Deville is ruined. The poor little man, said Mrs. I feel quite sorry for him. No need to, said the white cat. He's as bad as Cruella. The only difference is she's strong and bad, and he's weak and bad. Anyway, they're going to leave England tomorrow to get away from their debts. But where will you go, asked Pongo. The white cat looked surprised. Go? I shan't go anywhere. I've just come. Here. I'd have come a long time ago if you dogs hadn't barked. That night your pets gave me a kind sardine. They won't turn me out. I'll pop up and find them now. Then Pongo and Mrs. sank into a blissful sleep without a care in the world. Except that they did want to know what the dearlies were going to do with so many puppies. And so did the dearlies. Most people who are good at arithmetic are likely to think there is a mistake in this story. It is called the 101 Dalmatians. Well, Pongo and Mrs and Perdita make three. There were 97 Dalmatian pups at Hell Hall, including those belonging to Pongo, Mrs and Perdita. Three and 97 make 100. Where, then, is the 101th Dalmatian? He has been mentioned, but many listeners may not remember him. Those who do not shall soon be reminded of him and those who do shall soon learn more about him. On to the last part of the story, if you please. Christmas Day at the house in Regent's Park was absolutely wonderful. The rather good hotels sent plenty more stakes, and though there were not, of course, enough presents to go round, the pups were able to play with lots of things in the house which were not intended to be played with, but were played with ever afterwards. The dearlies took all the pups into the snowy park, Pongo, Mrs and Perdita circling round to make sure none got lost. And at twilight, Pongo and Mrs firmly led the dearlies up to the top of Primrose Hill and barked over a dogdom-wide network. They even managed to get a message through to the gallant old spaniel, for two dogs from a village five miles from him made a special trip in order to bark to him. He sent a message that he and his dear old pet were very well. Of course, the dogdom-wide barking was relayed. The farthest away dog Pongo and Mrs spoke to direct was the Brigadier General Great Dane over towards Hampstead, who was in great barking form. There is something very mysterious about this barking at twilight, said Mrs Dearly. Do you think they're sending messages? Mr Dearly said it was a charming idea, but... And then he stopped. Was anything beyond dogs? Not when he thought of all Pongo and Mrs had done. How had they got 97 pups back from Suffolk? Pongo and Mrs longed to tell him, but they never could. As soon as Christmas was over, Mr Dearly decided to act quickly, for he realised that 100 Dalmatians was too much for one house in Regent's Park. It was even a bit much for Regent's Park. So one fine day in January, when all the snow was gone, he said to Mrs Dearly, Let's drive out to Suffolk and return the little blue cart to Master Tommy Tompkins, and also hunt for a country house. And we'll have a look at the house where the puppies were imprisoned. Not that we'll take that one. Mrs Dearly laughed at such an idea. They took Pongo and Mrs with them, and Lucky came as a stowaway under a seat, because he wanted to see the sheepdog again and be made a captain. He didn't stay under the seat long, and everyone was delighted to see him when he came out. When they reached Dimpling, they went for a walk round the village and met Tommy Tompkins out with the sheepdog. So the little blue cart was returned then and there, rather a relief to the dearlies, who wouldn't quite have known what to say to Tommy's parents. They didn't have to say anything to Tommy, as he still wasn't quite talking, although his chuckling noises were at last beginning to sound more like human than dog. The dearlies saw at once that Pongo, Mrs and Lucky knew the sheepdog, and the tabby cat that came hurrying up. And now we'll find Cruella's house, said Mr. Dearly. When they got to Hell Hall, there was a large notice outside saying, For sale. Cheap. Owner gone to warm climate. And the gates stood wide open. The house was empty. 
What a hideous house, said Mrs. Dearly. But what a lovely wall, said Mr. Dearly. One thing had been worrying him. If he took a hundred Dalmatians into the country, how was he to prevent them from running wild? This magnificent wall was just the thing. Then he looked up and saw the folly, and both he and Mrs. Dearly took a fancy to it. And they decided, then and there, to buy Hell Hall and make it into a beautiful house. The alterations to Hell Hall were quickly made, and one sunny day in early spring, a removal van and an extra-large double-decker motor coach stood outside the house in Regent's Park. The van was for the furniture. The coach was for the Dearleys and the Dalmatians. The nannies had already gone down by car to open Hell Hall, Nanny Butler driving. She had added a smart chauffeur's cap to her butler's outfit. Mr. Dearley came out of the house with Pongo and Mrs. Mrs. Dearley followed with Perdita and the white cat. Within the next few minutes, two surprising things had happened. First, just as Mrs. saw the removal van and said, Oh, there's a miracle. A Staffordshire Terrier flung itself from the van, said, Here we are again, to Pongo and Mrs., and hurled itself at Mr. Dearley's chest. That's a compliment if you only knew it, said Jim, who was standing by the van. That's right, said Bill. Old battering ram's fallen for you. And I for him, said Mr. Dearley politely, rising from a sitting position. Pongo and Mrs. managed to quieten the Staffordshire before he paid any compliments to Mrs. Dearley. And then the second surprising thing happened. A large car had drawn up, and the people in it were looking at Pongo, Mrs. and Perdita with interest. Suddenly there was a wild commotion in the car, and then the door burst open and out sprang a superb liver-spotted Dalmatian. He dashed up to Perdita. It was her long-lost husband. His name was Prince. The people in the big car were much touched by his faithfulness to Perdita and at once offered him to the Dearleys, saying they would be glad of a good home for him, as they were always going abroad and having to leave him in kennels. Prince was delighted. Apart from wanting to be with Perdita, he knew good pets when he saw them. When the Dalmatians reached the village of Dimpling, all the villagers were out to receive them, with the sheepdog, the tabby cat, and Tommy Tompkins well to the fore. Tommy had his little blue cart with him, and the cat pig felt just a bit envious, but she was happy to know she had grown too strong to need any cart. The white Persian cat, who was now a charming creature, kindness makes kind cats, was extremely gracious to Lieutenant Tibb, the farmyard tabby. It was the beginning of a firm friendship. At last the motor coach drove in through the wide open gates of Hell Hall. The pond now reflected a snow white house with muslin curtains at all the windows. The front of the house still seemed like a face and had an expression, but now it was a pleasant expression. The nannies were waiting at the open front door. As they came to meet the Dearleys, Nanny Butler said, Do you know there's a television aerial on the roof of this house? And Nanny Cook said, Seems wasteful not to make use of it. Then Mr. Dearley knew the nannies wished for television in the kitchen, and he at once suggested it. Pongo and Mrs. were delighted, for they knew how very much their smallest daughter had missed it. But during the many happy hours the cad pig was to sit watching it in the warm kitchen, she never liked it quite so much as that other television, that still, silent television she had seen on Christmas Eve when the puppies had rested so peacefully in the strange, lofty building. She often remembered that building and wondered who owned it, someone very kind, she was sure. For in front of every one of the many seats there had been a little carpet-eared, puppy-sized dog bed.